Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is Pangolin Advisor and you're about to watch my day in the life of a dungeon master live stream video on demand. Over here you can find out which tools I use when I prepare for my Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition sessions with my friends from abroad. I'll also showcase how I design an entirely new monster from scratch as well as show you how I start preparing a map. This video is mostly dominated by the monster creation process and speaking of which, before I let you watch the live stream VOD, because this is an intro I recorded afterwards, I would like to encourage you to check out the very end of this video, since at the end I will show you the actual end, pr the end result of my creature design and show you what I changed after the live stream was over and show you what I polished and yeah, all the good stuff. So do make sure you check out the last bit of the video. The links and timestamps will be in the description, so you can just click on the description to jump to your desired topic that you want to learn about. And now, I'll let you listen to my past self. Enjoy. I am a dungeon master with quite a good amount of experience in running Dungeons & Dragons sessions in the 3rd and 5th edition. And for the two of you that don't know, who am I kidding? Everybody knows what D&D is, but I'll explain it anyway. It's a pen and paper RPG system where there are players and there is a dungeon master. Players play their individual characters and the dungeon master serves as the narrator and the arbiter. The player says what they do and the dungeon master says what happens. That's basically the gist of it, although there are also dice involved and that's where things get a little bit more complex. However, as I said, I do assume that most, if not all of you, already know everything there is to know about the Dungeons & Dragons, otherwise you would not have clicked on this live stream or this video. So, I'll briefly explain what this uh, particular live stream is going to be all about. And this particular live stream will demonstrate my favorite tools in, that I use when I prepare for running a Dungeons & Dragons campaign for my friends. I'll showcase how I design monsters for my characters to face. I'll show you how I design maps that my players can play on. And I don't mean just the map that you can see over here in the live stream right now. This is just an overall area map, one of the areas the player characters will visit at some point. I mostly am talking about important places of interest, dungeons and all of the good stuff. So those maps are probably the most crucial for me. And briefly explaining why, I am running Dungeons & Dragons uh, games for native English speakers. Like everybody I run this game for is a native English speaker. And I am not, I'm the only one who isn't. So this is a little bit of an issue, as you might imagine, for somebody who is in fact not a native English speaker. So I decided to go around this issue by simply designing a lot of maps that will help me do the heavy lifting when ex trying to tell a story. So I don't necessarily have to say, explain exactly what's around the corner, what's on directly below my player character's boots, what they're exactly looking at. I can just move them into a map and they will and they will have everything they need to see over there. And I'll just explain some details that they otherwise wouldn't be able to see, and so on and so forth. It's uh, very convenient, of course, for me, and it does help me quite a bit. Of course, it doesn't mean that I shouldn't explain things as we go along in roleplay, but making maps, in my opinion, makes your work as a DM much, much easier. That being said, map making will be the last thing I'll showcase on this live stream. Before we get onto that, I'll design some monsters that I already decided to call the Songborn, which uh, are monsters that my player characters have not yet encountered. They are monsters that are only exist aw far away from the starting area that my characters are only soon going to leave. And you know what? I feel like it's best if I briefly explain the current situation, the campaign that I'm going to demonstrate everything on. So the campaign I'm currently running is uh, only has three players in it, plus me as a dungeon master, of course. Honey, Liar, and Vuna, those are the player characters. And they start on one of the five major islands of an archipelago, and uh, 
they go from an island to an island. They are about to get access to a ship, which will allow them to go from an island to an island, which is going to also open up a lot of areas for my characters, which does mean that I need to prepare some random areas for my characters to encounter. Not just the important stuff like Bati Island, which is a major place I want my players to visit sooner or later, which has a number of different settlements and the like. But I also want my characters to have a chance to stumble upon some smaller, less impactful islands that can still nevertheless help me advance the story and give them an adventure to remember. So, in this particular instance, I prepared an island, or I rather will prepare an island on the stream where I'll showcase a new type of enemies that are being the Songborn, which I'll use later on in the campaign as well. Since my players have just actually managed to hit level 6. So now, you know, more difficult challenges should await them, right? Since level 5 is already a huge jump in the pack of, and the level 6 is even better than that. So, although by a bit, but still much better. By a bit and much better. That's very well put, dear Dungeon Master. How about you change the subject? Yes, I will change the subject. So, either way, I need to create monsters that are of reasonable strength for my players to fight that are different to other mass monsters i created up until now and so far my characters have faced a lot of undead so you know how the undead are there are a lot of the undead not usually very strong with some exceptions of course and quite resistant they don't run away under it unless they're told to you know the idea i showcased some astrorot which are basically elementals of a very very particular type since uh, the entire premise for my campaign is about the astral plane collapsing and a bunch of astral creatures appearing as a result as well as well as planar magic being a thing which is actually kind of nifty it allows uh, the players to have something else to do with their inspiration which in five edition you really don't have much to do unless you come up with a homebrew system like i did anywho so those are the monsters I already, uh, that are already there. They are the deformed, which are also a fairly high level, although specializing in magic, and there's a lot of magic shenanigans going on in there. There is the moss creature, which are plant-like creatures. And, you know, all of this is good stuff. But since I'm this campaign is taking place in a rather exotic environment, there are jungles, and, you know, imagine Chote, except it isn't Chote, it's actually an archipelago far away from the continent. So... I need some exotic monsters, and I thought to myself, what would be a good basis for an exotic monster that I could find some artwork for, that I could use for tokens, and tokens are very important, to place on the map and show where the enemy monsters are, or NPCs or whatever. So I needed something that I could find tokens for, and I need something that uh, will also be interesting and whatnot, and that would fit my idea. My idea was to create an ancient or rather race called the Songborn, that are actually uh, partially related to the monsters from the Feywild, if I can call them monsters. They are, however, not completely native to the Feywild, they are now stuck in the material plane. So I thought to myself, what would be an interesting uh, creature for that job? And after a bit of thinking about exotic creatures that could fit the job of being something that I could reasonably see exist in a Feywild, I thought that Platypus is uh, not a bad idea. I know. Adorable, funny, hilarious. How do they fit a Dungeons & Dragons game? I believe they can fit it just fine. And there are a number of tokens that I already have going for myself, prepared for myself, that also work rather well. So, without further ado, I do, I'll start showing you how I design monsters, since I already explained the basic idea behind the monster. I want something, something exotic, and something from the Feywild that is now stuck in the material plane. Good, I'll talk a bit more about that. But I did promise and forget to showcase the tools that I use for everything. So before I move on, I'll briefly show you my favorites. First of all, this particular map was created in Incarnate, and I am not sponsored by them. I'll explain that right away. I'm not sponsored by anything that I showcase. I just showcase it because I want to. And by the way, if you want to listen to music in the background like I do right now, I recommend uh, Cryo Chamber. They are amazing, and they have great music for Dungeons & Dragons as well. Highly recommend that. <laughs> but with that out of the way, 
For the maps that are large area maps, I use Incarnate, although I'm tempted to try out Wonder uh, Draft. I have not given it a chance yet, but it seems very promising. As for maps that uh, are dungeon maps, I personally like using something that is called the Dungeon Painter Studio, which you can see right here. It's a fairly nice tool. It doesn't have too many assets in and of itself, but it does have Steam Workshop because it is a program that is only available on Steam, if you see. So you can download a bunch of assets and use those, and uh, I'll show you how I work around with those in the future, but thankfully a lot of uh, player, player, not players, but users make a lot of stuff for this, and it's really intuitive, easy to use, it's lovely. So I'll show you how I operate that, but I do encourage you to check it out. Next up, I did mention the tokens. So for the tokens, let me just change uh, what you can see right now. So for the tokens, uh, where is that thing that I want to show you? Is that it? No, is that it? I'm sorry, I'm getting my window captures confused. confused. There we go, that is the one I was looking for. This is called a token tool. You can just Google it, I believe you'll find it. And it is quite useful, you just drop any kind of artwork into the token tool and it will uh, create a token that you're looking for. Let me just demonstrate this by dropping in something that I'll use uh, today when I create a monster. For instance, I already explained the type of monsters I want to have in my campaign. I want them to be small monsters as well, since so far I haven't had too many small monsters as opponents for my players. But I need them to be able to move around the entire archipelago, so I need them to have a means of transport. And I figured that, you know, something like this would do quite nicely. And I will need to link you into the artist that actually created this artwork, because it's quite a great creature. Uh, so I'll link that somewhere later. Either way, so with the token tool, all you have to do is, I suppose I might just do it right now, Choose the type of border you want. There's the end result shown in the top right corner. Zoom out a little bit. At the very least, I want to zoom, it out, zoom out. Just to give my players an idea of what the token represents. Because the token is just for them to know what's there on the board. Know what they have to look out for and avoid, etc. Et so, this should be fine. It shows the head and not much else. I could zoom it out further to show the wings as well. It's a little bit small if I do that, but... Maybe if I just keep it like this, again, it's just a token, it doesn't, it's not here to provide my players with artwork necessarily, it's just there to show them what they are facing more or less. Maybe zoom out slightly further, and this should be okay, just show the paw as well, and yeah, and then you can just save it and it's that easy. So, I highly recommend the token too. Finally, another thing I use is a calculator. That's the most important tool for a dungeon master to use, but I'll not showcase that. I believe oh, everybody has a calculator. And honestly, you don't need much else except for the thing you see in the background right now. This, ladies and gentlemen, is Roll20. The editor for Roll20, to be more exact. And this is what a dungeon master would see. Roll20 is absolutely amazing. It not only has a very, very large compendium for D&D 5th edition, and I assume other things, but I only play D&D, so I cannot speak for any other systems. But if, you look if you're looking for something like a bugbear, for instance, I'm sure it will find it, and there we go, it's a bugbear. And yeah, it's just for you to use, and you don't need to pay for that either. If you want, of course, to have some exotic monsters and one not thinks that Wizards of the Coast published, for instance, in Xantra's Guide to Everything, well, you gotta buy Xander's Guide to Everything. Or use D&D Beyond, which is a service that I personally am not using. I'd rather stick to Roll20, which just allows you to have sessions overseas with players that live far away from you. And it fills all roles, except for maybe voice communication, which I use Discord for that. So, that said, I believe I covered all of the tools that are important. During the stream, I will also showcase uh, some of the PDFs from the official core rulebooks because I'll need to pinpoint some things and I cannot exactly show you the actual physical books on a stream, right? Unless I had a camera, which, I mean, that I don't, and it is beside the point anyway. It will look awful either as well, I mean. So, with that in mind, now that I explained what all of the tools are, I'm going to 
Trituva cake, because why not? And I'm going, that's for just people who are watching this live on Twitch. They can see a new cupcake. I'm just very proud of it. Not cupcake, it's just a cake emoticon. Anyway, so now without blabbling for any longer, I'm going to actually get to the meat of it and show you the exact process for creating a monster. So we're going to work on the Songborn and right now on the stream, I'm probably going to just design two monsters. Uh, one being a representative of the Songborn race and one will be Windlet, which is the thing I just created a, a token for and the winglet will be the thing that the Songborn ride around uh, on. So, with that in mind, let's begin with the Songborn Grant. We can just simply in Roll20 uh, choose the Add Character option and it will create just a random character. Or you can of course import a, an already existing monster, but I want to create a new monster. The reason why I'm so keen on creating new monsters is because a lot of my players know Monster Manual by heart. And it's not fun if they see a monster, or rather I describe a monster, and they immediately know exactly what they're up against, even if they, as characters, shouldn't know that. That's why I, for the most part, use monsters of my own creation. So, let's begin, shall we? Let's start with the Songborn Grant, which is going to be the basic monster for the Songborn. So, that is all you're going to see when you create a new monster. That's not important, bio in an info song that you can fill out later. You can also add, for instance, an avatar, which uh, yeah, I highly recommend for you to you know remember what you're editing. A token is very important, but again, right now we haven't uploaded a token yet, so that's not something important. For the time being, the most important thing, oh, and I should actually show you this uh, window, so I work on that. There we go, you should see the window now. Sorry, forget about that. So this is all you see, and now I can just click on the character sheet. And as you can see, it shows me uh, just what looks like a player uh, character. But it's not supposed to be a player character, so just scroll down and to toggle the NPC mode, and that's now an NPC character. NP I shouldn't say NPC character because the word NPC already has character in it. Whatever, that's beside the point. The first thing you should do if you are a dungeon master on Roll20 cover is always click on output DM, GM, I mean, because uh, if you don't do that and then you misclick, then you accidentally, uh, you know, if I click that, then suddenly something will happen in the chat log. And if not for the fact that I had it set to GM, my players would have seen that. I already messed up quite badly in the past by forgetting to toggle this option, so make sure you don't mess it up like I did in the past. So, so far we don't have much to go for, uh, to go on. So firstly I need to explain again what this creature is supposed to be and we need to think about exactly what it's meant to do. And also edit a few, two more settings. Firstly, change the rolling settings to roll to 20, uh, legacy. It basically means that whenever you click anything it will roll two sets of dice instead of one set of dice, which is useful if you want to show, you, if you are wondering if the monster has advantage or disadvantage, you don't have to just click it twice, you can just enable this option and now whenever I click on something it will roll twice, it's amazing. Also break ties for the initiative, quality of life improvement, highly recommend that you toggle this on. So those are all the settings you need to worry yourself with. Now the important part. The first thing when you design a monster, once you figure out what the monster is supposed to be, and in my case it's going to be a fey, I might add a subtype to it, for instance, Songborn, that's not really important for now. Those are all these fluff things that you actually should not worry yourself with. They're less important than making sure that this monster works mechanically. So the first thing you need to figure out is uh, you need to figure out what you're aiming for, what your goal is when you create a monster. In my case, I want to create a monster that would be useful, I mean, a challenging monster for level 6 party of 3, but that will stay challenging even as the player characters level up. So, I'm going to now show you the PDF for uh, the Dungeon Master's Guide. Sorry for the low quality, I had to find it somewhere because, again, I couldn't show you the physical copy. That's a calculator, that's the token tool. That's it, sorry. <laughs> so yeah, pardon the quality, but the quality really does matter. Either way, 
This is very important because this shows you the monster statistics by challenge rating and it will help you go through the process of designing a monster. And in my case, well, the first thing that we need to establish is how difficult the monster is supposed to be. Of course, the challenge rating is just an estimate of the monster's strength, but it's a good place to start. And if I want a monster to be a threat to level 6 uh, characters and for the for the monster to stay a threat to level 6 characters, then I might also need something else and I also downloaded one more PDF for you just to showcase that, but I do encourage you to just buy the original books. I do prefer the printed version over the PDF version. That's just me, how I just like paper itself. Where the balls is that PDF? Give me a second, and I believe this is it, Xantra's Guide to Everything. Amazing book, and on uh, page 90, you can find a table that's uh, about monsters. And basically it shows you how many monsters you need to be challenging enough for one player, or multiple players. So again, my players right now have reached level 6, and they are hopefully going to reach other levels. So I need something that would be challenging, quite challenging right now, and even... And it's still challenging even later on, maybe even at level 15 or so. So my idea is to go for something that's of challenging uh, rating 2. Because according to this table, a monster of challenging rating 2 should be a good match for one player character of level 6. That is just an estimate. You have to use common sense later, but we'll get to that. This is just a starting designing a monster. That's the most important step. And as you can see, level 2 monsters are still usable even for level 20 characters. You just need to have a lot of them. But I'm mostly concerned about those two tables right here. Level 6 to level 15-ish. And as you can see, challenge rating 2 monsters always remain a viable opponent option. Which is very nice. And now we know that challenge rating 2 is a good thing to aim for. So I got to go ahead and input challenge rating into my newly created Songbon Grunt. So with that in mind, let's start thinking about other things. So what role do I want my master to serve? That is the second most important question you have to ask yourself. Are your masters supposed to be agile? Are they supposed to be smart? Are they supposed to use tactics, ranged attacks, magic, some kind of melee attacks of, uh, that are very strong, or maybe some melee attacks that are very quick, what you're going for, and what role does this master serve in combat? Is he a distraction? Is he supposed to go after the wizard of the party? Is he supposed to stand in the front line and protect his teammates? Is he supposed to sit in the back and cast the buffs on other monsters? There are a lot of options for you to choose from, really. Personally, however, I want this monster, I want the Songbone to be fairly agile. They are raised from the Feywild, so it does make sense for them to be agile. Moreover, I know that so far, I have various types of monsters in my game already that uh, the player characters have a lot of answers for. Not all and the answers, of course, that would be bad, but they have a lot of answers for, with one exception. There's one party character that seems useful, in fact very useful and very powerful in nearly any condition, and that's the party's paladin, who hits like a truck, a single hit from the guy, and I'll just showcase that to you. A single hit from the guy is humongously powerful. I mean, look at those attacks. Okay, this was a very poor attack roll, but still, it was a 9 on a great weapon master. And look at the potential damage he would deal if he were to hit. He cleaves through everything. And I do want him to cleave through everything, but I don't want him to outshine my other characters. I want to create a monster that will make the other characters feel like they are the ones that have to step up when the Paladin underperforms. And the Paladin already has their dedicated monster race per se, since I do have Undead in my campaign, and the Paladin loves killing those guys. So with that in mind, I need to again go back into the windows I just showcased to you, and I'm going to think to myself, all right, so I want this monster to hopefully have a better chance at surviving strong damage, strong, very strong attacks that are also fairly accurate, which is already a, a challenging thing, but I want him to be susceptible to fast attacks, I want him to be so, somewhat susceptible to magic and all of this good stuff. All right, okay, this gives me some ideas. Also, because it's a monster based on the platypus, 
I can also introduce some ideas from the platypus, such as, for instance, its electrolocation, its venom, all of those are good stuff. So now I have a decent idea on what I want the monster to be about, more or less, and the role that this particular grunt is supposed to take. So this grunt is going to be a frontline skirmisher unit. He's not necessarily keen on standing in the front line, but he can because the platypus, I mean, they're not exactly what you expect the frontline fighters to be. They're not supposed to be tough, right? So this guy is going to be the one unit the platypus, the songbone, I'm sorry, have that can stay in the front line, but not for too long, hopefully. Something that can fight from the distance, weaken the enemy from the distance, and then also be relatively effective from up close. So, again, a skirmisher unit, hopefully an agile one as well. Excellent. Now that we know everything there is to know, we can start working for real. So first things first, the challenge rating is determined by how strong a monster is offensively and defensively. In my case, I'm going to probably start walking through the whole defensive aspect, since that is more important for me than deciding how the monster attacks. That's not too important. I know that the most important thing about this monster will be how he moves and what potential abilities he may have. So, let's think about it. Looking at the table, I know that I'm looking for aiming for a monster of challenge rating 2. So I could either have the monster be equally strong on the defensive and offensive, or I could make the monster be more focused on uh, defense rather than offense or whatnot. We'll see how it goes. For the time being, I think I want the monster to be balanced. Like I said, it's a jack of all trades. So, this table over here tells me that I'm aiming for ammo class of 13 and hit points around between 86 and 100. So I already don't like this. This is way too many hit points for something that came from the Feywild, something that is supposed to be very agile, is also something that I would expect to have more armor points, a better armor class. So I want this monster to have something uh, much higher armor class, and preferably fewer hit points. And the rule of thumb is that if you're still aiming for the challenging rating of two, in my case, then you can increase the armor class by two, and this will allow you to use, and this will force you to use the hit points of one step lower down the line. So, for instance, if I gave this Songborn Grant AC of 15, I should use 71 to 85 hit points. Mm, that's okay, that's okay. Although I'm very tempted to give him even less hit points, so he's because he's really not supposed to be a tank, and I can give him a bit more AC. So, if I were to use between 50 to 70 hit points, which is okay for a challenge rating 2 monster uh, that is supposed to be not too tanky, then I will need to use, according to this guide, uh, an AC of 17. And don't worry how he gets this AC. We'll deal with that later. Right now we care about numbers, and then we'll figure out where they come from. Maybe it's high dexterity, maybe it's some armor. We'll think about it. Maybe it's natural armor, but I doubt that. Right now, numbers are the only thing that matters. So, okay, I can just simply input everything I need to. It's a small monster, mind you, so they only need a d6. And let's say, so what do I need to get 50 to 70 HP? Let's see about 10 die, then that's way too little. And maybe this monster will have a constitution bonus because they're tough, they're from the Feywild, but they have been on the material plane for some time. And they are based on the platypus, those are resistant bastards. So a constitution level of 13 seems good. This already increases our number of hit points. So maybe 15 die. And now he's up to 67. That's a little bit too many hit points. That's a few too many hit points. 63 is more like it, but I think I can just leave him with 58. This, as you can see, puts him somewhere in the middle of one of a half of a CR monster's worth of hit points. Of course, he makes up for this with high armor class. But now we have to think about, is this ridiculously high armor class really good for us? Because AC of 17 is actually really, really difficult to go for. I mean, okay, not that difficult for our paladin friend, but for other characters it might be. And again, I want this monster to be killable by non-paladin <laughs> players in my party. So, instead of uh, messing with this, and by the way, as you can see, the maximum recommended ammo class is 19. You can go higher, of course, but that's the maximum recommended one. 
so anyway, if I want to lower the ammo class by, but still keep the monster survivability exactly where it is, then I just need to go a few pages further in the Dungeon Master's Guide and look for the monster's features. And as you can see, some of those features have an effect on the monster's effective armor class because the most, those features make the monster more likely to survive something. Also, there's another thing you can use, another trick in your book, is that whenever you give a monster advantage to something, or disadvantage, of course, then you either add or subtract four, be that you add or subtract four from the monster's armor class or from the monster's uh, bonus to attack, attack bonus. So, with that in mind, I can now think about making this monster special. And I want to, so it's time to design some racial traits for the Songborn. And this is the interesting part. I will have several types of Songborn in my game. Not just the grunts. I will have Songborn rogues, for instance, maybe some shamans. We'll see what I figure out. I mean, I have some vague ideas, but we'll see. So, I needed something that will unify all of the song bonds, something that will tie them together. And, and a, of course, some abilities, well, you can take, uh, they are just somewhat obvious. For instance, electrolocation, because that's what the actual platypus have, and this would probably give them some kind of blind sight. For instance, in a range of 15 feet or something. I have no idea how good is platypus electrolocation, but it's probably not bad. And when I give fluff to this ability, maybe I'll make it only work in the water. Or maybe not, those are magical creatures after all. Maybe their blind set works even outside of water, which would make those creatures very good at detecting hidden foes. That's something to consider. But I already have monsters with eco-location, so maybe I want to tone down the effectiveness of this ability to only work in the water, because I do want to give my player characters some stealth options. That doesn't matter. What does matter is an ability that, as I said, is going to make this monster more survivable and allow me to lower the armor class. So I was thinking about some kind of ability, and let's call it Ability, because we don't need to figure out the name of the ability, that's just for you, the dungeon master, to see. It's not important. But let's think about what it does exactly. So, I was thinking, the best way to really deal with a real hard-hitting paladin, especially a paladin that, after killing an enemy, or having a critical hit, can then attack again as a bonus action. How do you do that while still making other characters effective? For instance, the wizard and the monk in the party. Well, monks hit a lot of times, and wizards often attack uh, the enemy saving throws rather than the, than the enemy AC. So, I can just have something that gives the enemy disadvantage on attack rolls. Of course, just giving a flat out disadvantage on attack rolls at all times is really bad. So you would want to avoid that if at all possible. Uh, because, I mean, at this point you might as well lower the armor class because having constant disadvantage against this monster um, this is just OP and stupid and would annoy your players. So, what I need is just this thing to proc in a certain situation, for instance, at the start of a battle, because the paladin can just walk in, usually, and instantly kill an important, powerful enemy without even worrying about it. How do I counter that? By making it harder for the players to instantly kill an enemy. So how about the advantage on attack rolls when Songborn Grant is at full health? So that's, of course, not the proper wording, so uh, whenever somebody attacks, uh, what how I would call it is that whenever somebody attacks the Songborn, no, uh, when the uh, attacks against the Songborn have disadvantage when the Songborn is at full health, or something along those lines. The exact uh, wording right now doesn't matter, it doesn't matter, because, again, this is just for the Dungeon Master to see. Right now I just want to showcase it to you what I what I what I'm designing without wasting too much of our time, right? So the advantage on attack rolls against the Songborn Grant when the Songborn Grant is at full health. Alright. And we're gonna call it for instance since they are called the Songborn and Song will be a big part of what they are as a race, we can call it for instance um 
Something, something, something. I don't know. Something songy. We don't have to worry about the wording. That's not important. Let's figure out how we construct the monster right now. So, right now we already know that the monster, uh, that whenever you want to attack the Songbone, when the monster Songbar is at full health, you have disadvantage. So you have to damage him to be able to fight him properly. Maybe they are just always at calm and at peace when they are at full health because they are so focused. And when they are injured, they lose their focus and that's why they are easier to hit. So how does this really convert into armor class? By how much should I now lower the armor class, since I obviously boosted this creature's survivability by a bit by giving it this ability? As I said, disadvantage usually means that usually acts as an effective plus four to armor class. But this isn't just a flat out disadvantage to attacks against the monster at all times, like taking a dodge action as a bonus action would be, right? Not uh, so. Let's think about it. It only works on the first turn, potentially, because it's very likely that the players will get to hit the enemy on the first turn. And what matters when you determine the monster's challenge rating are, the on are only the first three turns. For instance, when you count the damage the monster can dish out in a turn, again, what we will be calculating later on during this guide will just be the very three turns of combat. Those are the most important. You don't need to worry about what happens after the three turns. Alright, so this thing only works on one turn out of three turns, most likely in most situations, most scenarios. Okay, that's one third of uh, plus four to AC, in my opinion. Maybe even a bit less, since uh, once one player character hits the Songbone, other player characters will not have to deal with the disadvantage. So it's even less than one third of plus 40 AC. So in my opinion, this ability is an effective, sorry, effective plus one to AC. Bam. And because of this, I can now lower the AC, the actual AC to a 16, making this monster easier to hit for characters that don't have a humongous bonus uh, to their attacks. And of course, this monster is still Fairly large armor class of 16 is not really is actually no joke. But again, I want this monster, monster to be agile because uh, that's what I want the monster to be. It's as simple as that. That's why I gave him so little hit, so a few hit points. All right. So where does this armor class actually come from? We can figure that out while we think about it. So the Songbone, they do form tribes. They are meant to be chaotic creatures. I might as well import this already since I'm talking about this. I'm not sure if they are. Chaotic evil or chaotic neutral, so I'll just input chaotic something for the time being. Since again, this is something we can iron out at the end of monster creation. Right now, we figure out the numbers. So they do have tribes and whatnot. Again, I'm this campaign is set in a exotic environment. So should he be wearing armor? Probably some armor, maybe some shield. And if we look. And again, this, I'll show you why Roll20 is amazing, because if I just disable those windows for now, and I go into Compendium, I can look for armor. And once it finds some, it should be able to find me a list of armor in the game, hopefully. Yeah, it did. And that's not a table, actually. There we go, that's a table. And as you can see, it shows me everything that there is in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. I mean, the equipment at the various, in the base core row, rule books. So, Let's see what kind of armor this monster would have. I'll just move this over here, show you the window again. Not this one, this one. So I'm looking at this and I'm thinking to myself, all right, maybe started lever, uh, but this is, I'm not sure if this is really something that the Songbone would be capable of doing. I feel like they're not too attached to actually working things because they are from the fair while they don't like material playing they don't like working they like to deal with things with magic so maybe lever is just good enough plus 11 plus dex and because this is a skirmish unit i think i should give it a shield as well for extra plus two so i know he'll have lever armor and shield so that's plus three ac so if i go back to the sunborn round i can input now lever armor plus uh, shield so i now know where this where this uh, ac came from so that's plus 3 ac from lever armor and from the shield 
Okay, so now it means that I'm missing three AC because 16 has to come from somewhere and 10 is the base. So this tells me that the Sunborn have a bonus to dexterity equaling plus three. Or potentially maybe they have some natural armor, but I think it would make more sense to just give them a plus three bonus to dexterity, especially since I want those creatures to be very dexterous and nimble. Uh, I think 16 is good enough. I don't want to give them 17. They're not that nimble. After all, they are platypus. Not to offend any Platypus viewers, if I have any, of course. All right, so as you can see, by deciding how agile, how defensively strong I want the monster to be, I also figure out how I want the society to operate, what kind of equipment I want them to use, and I figure out already what the two of the six stats I want to have. I know I want to have a con modifier of plus one, in order to have some kind of bonus of hit points. I don't need it, of course, I can give him more hit die and I can take away the constitution modifier, but I like it, I think it's fitting for a creature from the Fey Wild, honestly. And I already know the dexterity modifier, which will help me design this, uh, this creature's attacks. So now that we know more or less how this creature is capable of defending itself, of course, that's just the basis, we haven't determined its speed, Although I can just already tell you that it will probably be something like 25 since it's, it's a small creature It can probably swim since it's a platypus, but probably not that well. So again 25 But this is not important we can deal with it later for now Let us focus on offensive challenge rating the fun stuff the attacks So this is just the sunborn ground probably the least magical of all maybe those are just some youngsters or some ill-disciplined folk Although I want all Songbone to be ill-disciplined, but that doesn't matter right now. So let's think about it. Actually, no, before I move on to actions, one last thing are damage vulnerabilities, resistances, immunities, and condition immunities. Those are important as well for you to think about because they can affect your defensive challenge rating. So I thought I already dealt with this, but I might as well deal with that as well. Do I want the Songbone to have any kind of condition immunities or resistances or whatnot? So maybe because they are the Fey, I want to give them advantage on charm, on you know charm spells. Maybe want to give them uh, resistance against poison. Poison is a very common damage type, and uh, the platypus do use venom actually, but they're not that resistant to venom themselves, from what I hear. So maybe giving them resistance to venom is that important, and you really shouldn't slap too much of that everywhere you go. If I were to uh, give this monster a lot of resistances then this would actually increase this monster's defensive challenge rating. Out over here is a table that would show you by how much on page 277 of the Dungeon, Master, Dungeon Master's Guide. So, okay, that's an option, but I don't really feel like giving this monster any particular resistances, immunities. I might give him some condition immunities, and in order to figure out what condition immunities I want to give this monster, if any, I will look at Monster Manual and just draw inspiration from some other fey creatures. In this case, those will be, let's see, sprites are a very famous example of fey creatures. And of course, my monster is, is a little bit more deadly and dangerous than sprites are, but let's have a quick look at them. So the sprites themselves, as you can see, they have nothing in particular in that regard. All right, in this case, there's one more tool that you may find, because maybe sprites are just too low level to have anything interesting, right? So how about, I go back into my browser real quick and show you the last tool which I forgot. Actually, one of the two last tools, which is called the Cobalt Fight Club, right here. So the Cobalt Fight Club is actually pretty cool. It sh it helps you uh, narrow down exactly how much experience your players got and how difficult each challenge will be for a particular group of players. As you can see, it already knows my particular uh, group that I run the campaign for. And it remembers that, and I can check that if I were to send those uh, monsters at my players, this would be probably a hard encounter. I never trust this thing in terms of how hard the encounter is. You need to look at the numbers yourself and crunch them. But it, what it is really good for is finding monsters for you. So if I'm looking for a Fey of maybe a higher level, hmm, Autumn Eldering, they come from Mordekainen's, Mordekainen's Tomb of Foes. I did not have a PDF of that to show you. Some hacks from the Volos Guide, and hey, a sea hag in a cavern. I'm sure if there's anything to have some kind of ability, this would be the sea hag, I assume. Right? So let's go ahead and look for a sea hag real quick. 
if it's uh, in the compendium. Monsters, Sea Hag, there we go. I should have used this in the first place instead of looking through the PDF. So the Sea Hag, as you can see, it has no interesting resistances of any sort. So this tells us that, well, if you want to have a Fey, it doesn't necessarily mean that they need to have some kind of amazing resistances. The Hag, for instance, is a Fey and doesn't have them. We can give our monsters resistances if you feel like it fits. In my case, I will think about giving them charm resistance of some degree. All right, I'll bite if I want to give them charm resistance to all of my Songbomb monsters. Let's have a quick look, see how strong would that actually be? So let me just, hold on a second, my PDF crashed. There we go, it works again. So, Fey Ancestry, let's see if it's somewhere in here. Because the elves have Fey Ancestry, which uh, works for creatures of the Fey, and Songbone are creatures that come from the Fey world. So is there Fey Ancestry in here? There is, the draw, the draw also have them. And as you can see, it has no effect on the challenge rating. So if I so desire, I can always go ahead and look for the draw drow or however you're supposed to pronounce it i'm sorry and look for them three answers three and it tells you that they have advantage on saving throws against being charmed and the magic cannot put them to sleep you know what i like this idea i think i'll just put this ability as is and this will tie my monsters a little bit stronger to the fey world so i'm just going to oh i'm sorry i don't think i showed you the window my bad so yeah the draw are right over here and I'll just input the Fey Ancestry and add it right here. So, Fey Ancestry, as easy as that. I can just copy the text from row 20. And there we go. Now my monster feels like a Fey creature because it has this ability. But it's not that powerful enough to really give this monster uh, any increase or decrease in its uh, design in its current child rating. So that's as the so that is that that's all she wrote. That's all I need to worry about for the time being. In terms of defensive challenge rating, good. That was a long sidetrack. Let's get back with the offensive challenge rating. So over here, we can see that uh, we need to start with something, and I need to ask myself a question. All right, what weapon do I want to use? Do I want those monsters to use a weapon in the first place? Well, they do use equipment, so I do want them to use some kind of a weapon, most likely. All right, what weapon? In order to answer that question, I will need to look at the stats. This monster is supposed to be very scary, as we can see. Attack bonus recommended is plus three, with 15 to 20 damage. And if it would have any abilities that require saving throw, then again, recommended value is 13, right here. Okay, I already know because my monster is quite dexterous. It's probably going to have a smaller amount of damage it can do in a single round because usually strength builds have more damage and the dexterity builds have more attack bonus. Uh, that's just a rule of thumb, it's not often true. Uh, so yeah, it's just something that I often go for and in this case, in my opinion, it will fit because, I mean, that's a very high dexterity bonus. It will make it quite easy for my monster to hit because if I were to have an attack of any sort and something for now, we will decide what it is later. So if I want this monster to have an attack, right, a melee weapon attack, and again, it's a skirmisher, it should have a melee weapon attack, I'll probably give him something ranged as well to weak. Uh, to weaken the enemies before they can reach the Songbong Grant. So, for that reason, I need to figure everything out. So firstly, I know that uh, this guy will use something that they are professional in using, so that will most likely be a finesse weapon, which allows them to use the dexterity modifier for their attack bonus, which is very important. Again, the same thing for damage. So now we know that at the very least, this monster's attack bonus will be a plus 5. This is already quite high, as you can see the recommended value is plus 3, and we got a plus 5. Thankfully, it can be easily remedied. Of course, it works in a similar fashion to what I showed you on the defensive uh, uh, stuff. So, if the attack bonus is higher or lower by 2 from the one that you can see in the table, you can just lower or increase the damage per round by one uh, pot in the table. So, for instance, if uh, this monster's attack rating, and I know already that this monster's bonus attack will be a plus 5, 
at the very least. Then it tells me that this monster should probably deal between 9 to 14 damage. I can try to toy around with those values later, but I'll see if I need to. First thing I need to do is look for appropriate weapons. So let's do just that. I'll just Google, not Google, but set for weapons, uh, weapons in the compendium. And uh, I shall just look on this and you should be able to find them real easy and real fast. And if I scroll down far enough, I should be able to see, there we go, a table with more weapons. I'll just make it a little bit bigger to make it easier for you to see. There we go, nice and easy. So, for those weapons, what da what does enough damage for me to really be satisfied by it? Keep in mind, I can always give my monster a multi-attack feature, which will allow the monster to attack twice. So, for now, let's just call this thing a multi-attack, because it's a monster that attacks that's it's a fast nimble monster it will probably attack more than once in its turn that's the hop on at any rate so it will have some sort of anti-attack but right now we don't know what it will be yet but we know that whatever we, weapon we will use we can multiply its damage by how much is to be seen so looking back real briefly at uh, this table will tell us again that uh, what we're aiming for is 9 to 14 damage in a single round so, of course, this can be split between several different abilities. For instance, maybe on the first round the monster uses a ranged weapon, and then on the second and third round the mo of fight the, monsters, the monster actually uses a melee weapon. Is that feasible? I think it's quite feasible. So, let's operate under that assumption. Because we'll need to use, and now we will need to use, a very, very important feature called the calculator for that. So, we'll keep the calculator over here. We'll note down real quick the amount of damage we're aiming for. We're aiming for between 9 to 40 damage per turn. So let's say 12 for now. And I'll multiply this by 3. Again, no, I don't want to stop streaming. Oops, I almost did that. It turns out that the multiplication button is the same button I have to end the stream. <laughs> Oopsie. Okay, I'll need to make sure not to press that. I'll just click things on the calculator itself. So anyway, as I said, you calculate everything only for the first three ten rounds of combat. Everything that happens afterwards is meaningless as far as uh, balancing is concerned. So 12 times 3 means that overall this monster is supposed to deal 36-ish damage during the first three rounds of combat. All right, how do, you, how do we achieve that? Let's have a quick look. See, I want it first to be able to attack the enemy. So this is the thing where I care less about the numbers for us for this moment. Then I care about actually seeing what the monster actually uses. So in this case, for the ranged weapon, probably something simple. Again, they don't use very high-tech stuff. I probably don't want them to use metal at all, in fact, as for many different reasons. Partially because I already thought that the Rust monster would be a very nice accompaniment you know, very nice company for the Songbone, and Rust monsters can be tamed, so this will be something scary for my players, even though they are of much higher level than what Rust monsters are designed to be fighting. Anywho, so if I look at the simple range weapons, the ones that are made entirely out of wood, what I see here that is uh, promising is potentially a dart, potentially a, sl a sling, Maybe a spear, for instance, or something, but this has to be something that's not too big. And spears have usually a metal end. They don't have to have one, but without that, it doesn't feel like a very effective spear, does it? A dart, mm, I don't like that. Darts are very, very weak. I wouldn't be able to get enough damage from them to make it meaningful, really, for higher level encounters. Crossbows, they have metal. They shouldn't be used. Slings, potential there, but they, again, do very little damage. And short bow finally is an option. So I can either give those guys a short bow or I could go ahead and look at some of my uh, house, uh, you know, house made weapons. And I'll briefly show you my house rules just to show you some things that I really allow the player characters to have. For instance, there should be something about, let's see, playing games, new weapons, new weapons. There we go. So I've got, for instance, Hunter Sling, which is a simple range weapon with uh, which uses ammunition. It has 30 to 120 range and then deals 1d6 bludgeoning damage. It's just a flat-out better sling. 
And I look, do like the idea of those guys having a sling. I also introduced the sand and throwing discs, which uh, are fun, but they are metal, so I don't like this idea. And metal chain is not a ranged weapon. So I think I'll just use Hunter's slings, which are, again, a homebrew item. I'll just zoom in on that. Well, not really zoom in, I just have that. So I'll keep this right over here, uh, over martial melee weapons, because those guys probably won't use martial melee weapons. Probably. So now I will go back to my monster real quick and uh, I'll think about everything. So what I learned so far is that it opens its it open it starts the combat by using the hunter sling. And it might want to use that for oh well, that's real poor writing, but that's what happens when I try to write things real fast. So anyway, it might use the sling on more than one round of combat, but it most likely won't be able to because a sling doesn't have the best range, right? So let's input everything that's important. It's a ranged weapon attack, so it uses dexterity. It has a range of 30 by 120, so probably those guys want to get pretty close to their enemies to use that, if they want to use it effectively, but they can feasibly use it from further away. Also, an important note is that those monsters prefer the underground from, you know, the overground areas. So again, a weapon, ranged weapon, that doesn't have very high range, is okay in their case, because they'll try to avoid open areas where bows would be more effective. So range is fine by me, I like this idea. Next I'll go for the damage, so I want to be consistent and I want my player characters to be able to pick up the enemy's weapons and armor and equipment after the fight is over. So for in this case I know that the Hunter Sling deals 1d6 damage and that's what my players know, that's what they will operate under. Uh, that's what the assumption they will make when they encounter this monster for the very first time. That whenever they are hit by the sling, they will take 1d6 damage plus dexterity modifier, and this would be bludgeoning damage. And I'm sorry, I cannot speak while well I type, that's why I don't, didn't type as much as I should have over here and whatnot. Anywho, so okay, this means that the hunter's sling deals 6 damage on the first round of combat. It's an ammunition thingy, so it won't be able to. So the monsters won't be able to use it more than once. That is not a whole lot, however. Like if we look at our calculator again, do I still have it on? Yes, I still have it on. It's in the bottom left corner. If you're looking for it, maybe I should move it somewhere. Give me a second. I think it's over some of the text. All right, let's move it to over here. Make it a bit bigger, maybe. Ah, it's as big as it needs to be, really. So. If we look again, I see that uh, 36 damage, and if I take minus 6 from that 36 damage, I'm still left with 30 damage. That's very big difference between the damage that you could do, that, that I have to do with my melee attacks, and the amount of damage I have to do with my ranged attacks. That's a bridge that I will try to cross later. For now, I know there is probably going to be a problem about the Hunter Sling. Alright, that's something that will be resolved in a moment. But firstly, I need some kind of melee weapon, and I already see I'll probably need something relatively hard-hitting. Not too hard-hitting, mind you, but relatively hard-hitting. Something good for a ranged uh, build. So first of all, again, I have new weapons that are house-designed for my players, and a lot of those are actually finesse weapons as well, but they are metallic, and I don't want those monsters to use metallic weapons. So that's not that important. Let's look at the simple melee weapons. And I see a bunch of options. I see a quarter stuff. A quarter stuff might not be a very bad idea for a small creature. If you are a small creature, you want to even the odds when you fight a large enemy by simply ensuring that you have the reach to reach your enemy. That's something that happens in real life, right? So it makes sense that monsters that even if they don't exist, but that they still use the same common sense. So a quarter stuff is an option, and it will allow those monsters to use a d8, 1d8 damage. What else do they have? A great club. A great club is an option. Again, it's not ideal because all of this still leaves us a, a problem of those monsters not being able to use finesse. Finesse is how those monsters should be operating, since again they use dexterity. They want weapons that have finesse in order to deal damage, and the only finesse simple melee weapon that they have access to is a dagger. Now that's a bit of a bummer, isn't it? Hmm. It is indeed. I could, in this case, design an entire new weapon that would be just more effective and just call it a simple weapon 
for those monsters to use and for my player characters to use as well. All right. All right, I'll bite. I might do that. Or alternatively, I can look at martial melee weapons and think about this whole metal thing. So even if those monsters want to use the rust monster that eats metal, maybe they just keep him well fed, but they do use some metal for themselves. Maybe not a lot because metal is kind of sparse on the archipelago, but maybe they looted enough to use some metallic weapons. I think this makes sense for them to use some metal after all. At least a little bit of it. So okay, I'll change my strategy, I'll allow them to use metal. And in this case I can use a rapier, which is a finesse weapon that deals 1d8 damage, that's already way better. Or, again, to tie those monsters more to the, my particular campaign, I can use weapons that my player characters already were interested in using and were using in the past. So I think I'll just do that. I have access to a horn blade, which looks like a pair of horns, it's based on a Chinese weapon actually. A Koyo sword, which is based on an Indonesian weapon, and finally a metal chain. The problem with metal chain, it is a finesse weapon, which is two-handed. It also has reach. A reach weapon is interesting for a skirmisher, isn't it? And it would allow them to also fight in close uh, quarter in close quarters. So that's something. It wouldn't do all that much damage, but it would be feasible. And it's not a very heavy weapon as well, and I don't imagine those guys would use a heavy weapon. So either that or the Koi Sword, Koi Sword makes the most sense. I think I'm... Hmm. It really doesn't matter all that much, honestly. But um, I already gave Metal Chains to some of the undead monsters in my campaign. And I don't want to repeat the whole shtick of, oh hey look, there's another monster using Metal Chains, how boring. Instead, I think I'll use a metal chain. It seems more ex uh, koi sword, I mean. It feels more exotic, it feels like something that the monsters that come from the Feywild would likely use. It also feels a little bit piratey, and who knows, maybe I want my monsters to be a bit of pirates since they do live on Archipelago. So, alright, koi sword it is, I'll bite. I'll go ahead and give them the koi sword. So, with that in mind, I'll go ahead and input a new action, and that will be the koi sword. Excellent. So with that in mind, I'm a little bit inconsistent because I could have given those guys a rage weapon that actually uses metal, but I assume metal is too precious, precious for those creatures to use as ammunition, but maybe not precious enough to not use as a weapon. That's what I will go for. It's a good enough explanation for now. I like the idea of those guys using slings and core swords. I actually don't. <laughs> And that's the problem of running a last stream that's supposed to be educational, because now I'm second-guessing myself. The two really don't mix. One is high-tech-ish, one is low-tech-ish. But maybe the Hunter Sling is reinforced with metal a little bit, and that makes more sense and feels more believable. Alright, so the Hunter Sling is reinforced with metal, but it doesn't use metal as ammunition. Alright, now it makes sense, now it's believable. I can move on without feeling like a bad DM. Okay, so first of all, it's a finesse weapon, so we have to apply the finesse modifiers ASAP. And I know, because that's what I told my uh, players, that uh, I'm going to use, uh, let's see, where is the code sword? It's right here, 3d2 damage, because that, again, I have to be consistent, that's what my players expect to see, 3d2. And that's, of course, slashing. And I have a question, so give me a second. So. Oh, absolutely. I will be uploading this entire live stream. First of all, you can check the VOD on Twitch after I stop live streaming. And uh, later on, because it will only stay live on Twitch for a few days, you can check out uh, my Panchasu channel. Not the Pangolin Advisor channel, because Pangolin Advisor is mostly about video games, not Dungeons and Dragons. At least, I might change my mind, but either way, I think I'll put it on my Panchasu channel. The link is down below, you should be able to find it. Thanks for asking, by the way, and uh, good luck with your uh, with your session. I hope you have a very fun time, and that your players will have a very fun time as well. And you know what? Here, have a holy piece of cake. So, let us uh, go back to designing a monster. So, with the coil sword, I already know its stats. So, looking at the stats right now, what do I have? Let's look at just the raw stats themselves. And look back at the PDF that I showed you earlier. So 
The PDF goes right over here on the top of everything except for the calculator. As I said, calculator, the most essential tool in the DM's uh, tool basket. Like, literally, it's so essential. So, I know th those monsters are, are supposed to deal 36 damage in 3 turns. Alright, so on the first turn they deal an average of 6 damage right now, according to what I have. And then on the next turns, average of 7 damage, so that's minus 14. And I'm left with 16 damage that's an assigned that I need to add in order for those guys to actually be threatening. And of course, I can use the same tricks I used last time when I... Let me just uh, scroll. When I went for monster's features to buff or lower monster's stats. And I could use the same for the monster's damage output or for the monster's effective attack modifier. But I like the attack modifier of plus 5. It will still feel, make, allow for my players to feel like they can, they are fairly nimble because most of my players have very high AC, except for the wizard who has 12. <laughs> oh yeah, he, he has some problems, but we, let's not talk about the wizard with 12 AC because that's really low. <laughs> anyway, going back on topic. So, I need those guys to keep their current attack modifier. Plus 5 is good. So, I would probably need to buff, uh, buff their damage output over to the 9 to 14 uh, damage per round that I design, which I already calculated should be 36 damage in 3 turns. So let's start buffing it. So multi attack will be, let's see, Songborn, Songborn Grunt can attack twice with its, sorry for you, the keyboard by the way, it's quite loud, I know, with its co sword or and just keep it like this so if i do it like this and attack twice with the co so this will make the monster quite a bit more effective because this will lower the chance of the monster doing no damage at the turn by ensure that because attacking twice even if the attacks are weaker ensures that uh, well you're at the very least to get half of your maximum potential attack rather than nothing if you miss on your first attack for instance so anyway if I do this twice, so let's see, 7 times 4, no, I don't want to stop streaming again, I cannot press the multiplication button because that actually crashes everything, because that's my shortcut for some reason. Anyway, uh, let's do this again. So 7 times 4, because again, we're only estimating the balance for the first 3 turns of, com of combat, so first turn, range attack, the f and the second and third turn, are melee attacks and he'll be able to melee attack twice in his own turn so he'll be able to deal seven damage four times if he hits of course so this will be a total of 28 damage so if we have 36 minus 28 we're left with a damage that he's supposed to deal with his hunter sling all right so right now what i'm getting from this is that if i add the eight damage to this Did I miss up somewhere? Oh, no, not at the end of that. If I add the 6 damage to this, right, we have 34 damage in 3 turns. Look back at the table, uh, and then let's divide it by 3 again. And when we look at the table, my arm must right now deals a little bit over 11 damage in, uh, in a turn, in a single turn. And the table says that this monster should deal between 9 to 14 damage in a single turn. Job well done! This monster can now slightly weaken the enemy from afar, and when it up close, the damn monster really turns into a death machine with its core sword and starts really, really harassing the enemy. Alright, that's good. This does have a side effect. It feels like this monster now likes being in close quarters combat a little bit more than I like it to, because it focuses on dealing damage from up close rather than dealing damage from the distance. So I can uh, do something to uh, about this in two ways. For instance, I can give this monster another option for ranged attacks or just make this option a little bit better. For instance, they can enchant the pebbles, the stones, the rocks they use for uh, in their slings, right? So these will uh, do more damage, obviously. Or maybe I could just give them plus one uh, ammunition for the slings, which then the player characters could take for themselves if the player characters ever wanted to use slings. That's tempting-ish, and I might go for this, but 
I'm not sure if those guys should have uh, plus one ammunition. It feels like that's something they wouldn't be able to forge, and that's not something they could just find on their own all that easily, right? Even if it's one of the worst plus one ammunition types. So, allow me to drink some tea before I continue my trail of thought. The other option I have is to give the monster a reason to want to potentially disengage from combat. So these creatures are probably quite cowardly. So, for instance, maybe those guys, when they go a little bit lower on their health, they want to avoid combat, disengage, and maybe heal up a little bit. Or maybe reactivate their something songy ability, which allow, which which gives uh, the enemies the enemy a disadvantage when the enemy tries to attack the Songborn. That seems like a good idea. So now I need two more things. Keep in mind, I don't want to make this monster too complicated. What I have right now, minus a little bit of feeling for the stats, but what I have right now is good on its own already. It doesn't have to have more stuff. But it's a challenge rating too, and I feel like if I will just release this monster against the players, the players will just slaughter it, and it doesn't feel like the skirmisher it's meant to be. So let's give it one more ability that will feel like something a platypus would have, and again, the Songborn are based on platypus. So, a let's say a Venom, Venom Strike, because the platypus have Venom, now you know. It's kind of amusing. So the Venom Strike will be... Do I want this to be an attack? Or maybe, because those monsters are innately attuned to magic, maybe they can use this Venom at range. I don't think I like this idea. I think I'll just make those monsters focus on attacking, and it would feel unnatural to use magic for something that's inherently biological, in my opinion. So this will be a melee weapon attack, a finesse weapon attack, because they use their own body parts. And uh, what else it will do? It will do poison damage, a little bit of poison damage. Now, what, it's going to do only a little bit of poison damage, so let's say it's going to do 2d4, which is going to be 5. Maybe I want to add a bonus that they have from Constitution, because poison, their own Venom feels like it should have their con modifier for the damage it deals. This damage is not really all that meaningful. What I, the only thing I have to take care of is to make it impossible for this damage to make the monster's damage output uh, that you can see on the calculator go beyond what you see on this table and my the thing that I'm aiming for, between 9 to 14 damage per 10. But I'm already on the low end of the damage per round thingy. I'm good. I could even make the poison strike a little bit better, especially since in order to use the Venom Strike, the monster has to abandon using the Cold Sword attack, which is very effective since it can use the Cold Sword attack twice. But before I do that, I need to do an Attack Rider. So this will be an effect that will allow the Songborn to potentially disengage from combat. Again, the Songborn are nimble, I could just give them disengage as bonus action, but it feels generic. And I want the Songborn to have something special tailored to them. So again, they'll use the Venom Strike for that. So this will be a Constitution saving throw. So this is a bit of uh, something that I will make my pad the player Paladin a little bit happier, since the Paladin will have a harder time against those monsters than the other players have because of the ability of something Songi. But Venom Strike targets Constitution, Paladins have good Constitution. So at the very least, the Paladin can feel like, oh, I'm not the best attacker against the Songborn, but I can still tank pretty well, right? So let's keep that. And the Constitution saving throw. Recommended value is 13, but we know that we go for lower attack and higher value. So if we go by two steps uh, further, we can see that the recommended save DC is 14. So can I get to 14 in some natural way? It doesn't feel like I can, but that's okay. We don't, you don't have to always follow uh, the modifiers. I can just give them plus three over here. And that's it. Constitution saving throw DC 14. And saving throw success is not poisoned. Because when the enemy is attacked by the, poison, by the Venom Strike, the enemy becomes poisoned. Quite simple, quite effective. Now you can say, hey, this doesn't let the enemy disengage. And you're absolutely right. So maybe poison is not the effect I'm going for. 
So what I read online, and I'll show you that real quick. What I read online about the platypus. Over here, when we go to Venom, it says that uh, the pain is so excruciating that the victim may be incapacitated. All right, there is actually something uh, in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition as incapacitated. I can actually have that. Wait a second, I just realized I didn't show you the Wikipedia page because the other thing was covering it up. Sorry. There we go. That's, that's the bit that I was showcasing right here. All right, let's go back. <laughs> Showing that I'm not making things up. Anyway, let's go back and... Uh, have a quick look see let's see at everything so i could use incapacitated which in case you don't remember again i can actually use uh, the road 20 compendium if i look for incapacitated wait that's not the compendium that's the compendium give me a second i know you cannot see this but you're about to see this there we go conditions incapacitated incapacitated creature cannot take actions or reactions that's a very very dangerous condition it significantly lowers the player's ability to do anything and i believe that this is actually fine this monster so far seems a little bit weak for channel rating 2. i feel like it doesn't really pull its weight just yet as a skirmisher especially but with a venom strike that makes the enemies incapacitated this is suddenly a lot lot scarier so Hmm. Hi the balance maker, welcome to the stream. I'm just trying to figure out if I really... Yeah, I don't want to do this to be an attack rider. So first, the songbird has to hit with an attack, which already will deal some poison. And the poison is so excruciatingly painful that it might incapacitate a uh, one of the player characters, potentially. Now the thing is, if we look back onto our trusty trusty table, we can see that, okay, the DC of 14 is good enough. But I'm thinking to myself, is it really? First of all, you have to always keep in mind that you have to plan things specifically for your campaign. You're not designing your campaign for a bunch of players, unless, of course, you're writing a campaign to be published online, in which case it's different. But I'm creating this monster for just three of my friends, and I know what those friends have, what characters they play, roleplay as. And... Uh, I know that the Paladin has an aura of protection, which gives all of his allies very high boost to saving throws. So a saving throw of 14, that ain't gonna cut it. That's going to be very rarely effective enough. So what can I do now? I can make the Venom Strike a little bit scarier in terms of poison damage, and it is supposed to be excruciating poison damage. So I could increase the DC, to d6 uh, yeah let's increase the dc to d6 so that it feels like it's scarier and more powerful this will increase the damage by two again this shouldn't mess around with our balancing our damage pattern it's a small increase and i had a lot of room to go with uh, to go with you know what actually let's make it a dl let's go crazy so yeah 10 damage on average with a venom strike way more than they can otherwise do with any other strike but keep in mind, in order to use a Venom Strike, they have to forego attacking with a Cold Sword twice. And using the Cold Sword twice, usually a better idea, if not for the fact that Venom Strike can incapacitate an enemy. Which is a very scary condition. So, how do I want this condition to work exactly? Mm, I don't want the players to just sit there and do nothing because it's very boring. That's why I'm very careful with conditions such as incapacitated. I make sure they don't last for too long if I ever do use them. So let's say that uh, the, you have to pass the saving throw. So pass the saving throw. And again, that's not how I'm going to phrase it. Right now I'm phrasing it very... It's just a makeshift uh, wording because I don't care about how it sounds. I'm the only one who's going to uh, read this. Later on, when I'm off stream, I'll make sure that it sounds like something that would be written in uh, in the game itself. So, anyway, if you pass the saving throw, uh, so pass the saving throw, or you're incapacitated until the end of, until the end of Songborn Grant's next turn. Alright, 
So this thing only lasts for a turn. It also allows the Songbird to do something after it uses the Venom Strike, potentially even run away and then use an ability or something, maybe attack the enemy while the enemy is incapacitated. Keep in mind, incapacitated doesn't actually make uh, player characters easier to hit, but again, this is supposed to be an escape ability, so I am fine with that. That being said, I don't like the wording of this. Do you know why? Because this will force you, this phrase, until the end of Songbong Grant's next turn, will make you, will force you to always keep in mind which Songbong Grant actually applied the Venom. Sometimes it might not matter. Sometimes it might be very, very annoying. Hmm. So I could either make it until the end of the target player's next turn, or I could keep it as is. I think I will just keep it as is. I have a tendency to group similar monsters in one initiative order, so it should be relatively easy for me to track. But this is something you have to keep in mind. It's not a recommended wording. If you have an option, I'd rather say that uh, it's best. I'd rather write something like until the end of the player's next turn or something like that. So. Yeah. Is that a good word? But I like the way it works right now because it makes this ability a little bit more potent, a little bit stronger for the Sunborn Grunt. And uh, actually, it doesn't matter at all. It just matters. Yeah, actually, sorry. I'm sorry for blabbling going, going in circles, but I just realized it's incapacitated. It doesn't give advantage or disadvantage, it just makes the player unable to act or react. So I can just change this to change it to make it say or you're incapacitated, incapacitated until the end of your next turn. So this already this allows the player to use its uh, their reaction for when the songbone runs away from the zone of influence for instance. It this allows the player to take any actions during the turn as well. But they will later on be able to use reactions, which makes sense because after some time the venom, the pain from the venom should go uh, less extreme, right? That is the hope at any rate. Okay, good. So this effect is, the incapacity effect is very strong, but it doesn't last for very long, which tells me it's probably fine to increase constitution even further. I know that according to the table, I should keep it at 14 due to everything I explained earlier. But I feel like increasing it to 15, maybe when 16 wouldn't be that bad. Considering the effect, considering that I have to forego a good amount of damage to use the Venom Strike. So, and considering my specific campaign, oops, that's a level too high right there. I believe that using a saving throw of 16, that's a difficult saving throw to pass, but this is an excruciating pain after all. Then again, it does do a good amount of damage. I'll just keep this DC to 15. 15 is not super high. My players will still be able to resist it most of the times. But again, I don't want to go against... You know what? Whatever. I will give it 16. I feel like because it only acts for 8 turn... No, incapacity is very strong. I keep going back and forth. That's why maybe I shouldn't talk about this on last stream for now. Let's keep it at 15 and move on, shall we? I might increase the damage from the Venom. I might make it 16 in the end. Doesn't matter, we have the vague idea of how this monster is supposed to work and I'll do some number crunching later on to figure out if it is balanced in my particular campaign. So, is the monster ready? Well, actually, basically yes. We know that this uh, monster can use... Typo right there. Can use the song uh, the the twice twice. We know that it can use this hunter sling, and we know that it can use a venom strike. But there's one more thing. Once it uses the venom strike, what does it do? Does it run to safety? Probably. Does it want to keep running afterwards? Probably not, because it's not a very good survival tactic when your speed is only 25. And they come for the Feywild. Feywild is a fairly dangerous place. So I think. I need to give those guys one more action. And this will be a ratio action. This makes this race a little bit complicated because they have Electrolocation, the Sungi ability, Fey Ancestry, and the ability action I'm about to give them. That's four abilities that every member of this race will have. It might be a little bit too much 
if I decided that it is too much, I might take away electro location, I might take away any ancestry. For the time being, I don't have to worry about it. So the final ability will be um, fine tune your defenses. That's again uh, just a name I have, a work in progress name. It doesn't matter. So what this ability is going to do, it will allow the Songbone to do something songy again, which would mean that I would need to change the wording again. But I can just use a different wording. So, uh, attacks. So when uh, the Songbone uses this ability, then attacks targeting the Songborn grant uh, this uh, advantage until Songborn grant takes any damage. So, all right, so this is basic, this basically works in the same way as the Songfeng Song ability. So the Songborn, once it's at full health, it always has the ability to evade attacks quite effectively because attacks against it have this advantage. But during over the course of the combat, if things are going poorly, this guy, I don't feel like it really fits the theme if I were to give him healing, but maybe if things are going poorly, this guy forgoes us in Cold Sword, uses the Venom Strike to, to incapacitate the enemy, then runs a little bit away as uh, this guy's friends delay the enemy, and then finally this guy uses this last ability, which I'll definitely change the name on. And uh, this ability will allow this guy to regain the ability to impose the disadvantage on its opponents until again this guy takes any damage. Now this could be a little bit tricky, but thankful uh, to remember that it works. But thankfully again, roll 20 is a really fun thing. So if I just have a look at roll 20 again, and just drag, hold on a second, let's close all those tabs, nice and easy. And if I drag just any sort of, uh, let's make sure I'm not looking for incapacitated. If I drag, let's say, Honey onto this map, and as you can see, she has taken a bit of damage. So I can always use some kind of thing to mark that uh, there's an effect on going. So let's imagine that this player character is actually the Songborn grant we were working on. So I can simply say that, well, if uh, he uses the ability I just added, that being the fine tune your def defenses, then maybe I'll just add this thing. It looks like a barrier matrix or something, I don't know. And this will let me know as a DM that, oh, hey, this guy now again imposes this advantage. And this will be visible to the players as well. And that's good because the players will notice that when this Songbon Grant returns after it retreated, it will seem a little bit different, right? It will look like it has found its inner peace again, it can focus on uh, defending itself properly again, and la -de da it's hard to hit again. So, it's something that I'll definitely want to communicate with the players, that's why I'll change the name of it, I'll make sure that it has some kind of song thematic, and uh, I'll describe how something happened that so that the players know exactly what's going on and they know that they have to again do any damage to this monster to make sure that uh, it can be attacked again although this is a very very vague wording if this was a player ability if our house brewing some player abilities i'll definitely make it only last for some time or until it breaks concentration which isn't that bad actually I could make all both of these abilities only work while Songbot has concentration, but this would make those abilities more powerful than I want them to be. I only want them to be a one-time thing, something that only has a chance to prevent the initial attack uh, against those monsters. If I figure out that this ability is too weak and that this monster is too weak when I do some number crunching, I'll simply buff those abilities. Maybe I'll make them bonus actions. Bonus actions. In which case, no, I don't want to make them bonus actions because I want the Venom Strike to still be an exit strategy for the monsters to use the last ability. Oops, did not mean to do that. So maybe I'll do something to buff them. For the time being, I'm relatively satisfied with how this goes. 
And with how this went, this gives uh, the monster plenty of options to do in a fight. This is how it looks if I disable the edit mode. Again, the wording will be changed when I'm off stream because we don't need to worry about how everything is written exactly. Finally, we can deal with the other stuff that is less important for battle. And uh, now that we know all the important things, because look again at our trusty, trusty table. We have done everything that is important to determine this character, this monster's challenge rating. It has a challenge rating of 2 because of its 16 armor class and 58 health. And because of its plus 5 bonus to damage, uh, because of its 11 point something damage per round, and because of its very high save DC. Save DC doesn't really matter. Like this uh, guide, this Dungeon Master's guide will tell you, you only have to worry about the more important bonus, either the attack bonus or the save DC. Of course, within common sense, I assume. So, with that in mind, you know what, maybe I'll give it a oh, 60. <laughs> yeah, still making up my mind, but I'll probably keep doing this until I wake up tomorrow and figure out what I want exactly from this monster. Doesn't matter. So now that all of the essential gameplay mechanics are implemented, I can deal with other stuff. So those monsters, are they strong? They're small monsters, they come from the Feywild. Are the Feywild monsters strong? Well, let's have a quick look, look see at the sprites. The sprites are very weak. They're also tiny, so not the best example. But maybe we can look at the Satyr. Satyr are probably quite strong because they are medium Fey. So as you can see, Fey aren't necessarily more strong, stronger or weaker than your average characters, although they too tend towards high dexterity and lower than average strength in my opinion. Those monsters are small. I feel like it would make sense to give them a strength of 9 to give them a penalty of minus 1. It won't matter in most scenarios, maybe in some strength saving throws, which are relatively rare. And again, this gives the player characters something to abuse against the monsters. By the way, something I forgot to mention when I was uh, investigating the monsters' uh, defensive stats is proficiency in saving throws. So the gist of it is, if the monster has proficiency, maybe it's written somewhere here. Mm, I cannot find it right now, but it was written somewhere in the Dungeon Master's Guide, so just look for it yourself. But if the monster has proficiency in, let's say, two or more saving throws, you probably, it, this probably means that it has a higher effective armor class. I forgot the exact wording for this, I would like to find it actually, but uh, it really doesn't matter right now, because all I'm going to do is potentially give them one saving throw proficiency or none actually. I'll think about this. So, we know this strength, we know its dexterity and the constitution, those have to be exactly as they are, because the entire balance of this monster is based around those numbers. Next we have intelligence. So these monsters are chaotic, I might give, make them borderline evil, maybe, bo maybe neutral, somewhere in between, maybe lowercase evil, I don't care, they're chaotic however. They know how to plan, they should be able to improvise, quite well, because I don't want them to actually be either stupid or smart. I already have very stupid enemies for my players to face. I already have very smart enemies for my enemies to face. I want something that just has a 10 in intelligence. So those monsters will have a 10 in intelligence. They'll be basically like humans. Maybe an 11, because they're from the fair world, but you know what? I think a 10 is appropriate and they'll just have massive egos and believe that they're more intelligent than they actually are. Okay, so with this in mind, this kind of tells me that their gut feeling, their perception, maybe not the best. Maybe they actually have problems with wisdom. Maybe they have only like 9 wisdom, for instance. Slightly below average. Nothing too game-breaking, but this will give the player characters, again, another angle to potentially use against uh, those monsters whenever the players actually meet those monsters. It's a steep road to go down, however, because so far this monster stat line, it's pretty bad, and especially against the enemy spells. So, while I do want the mo every monster should have a weakness, I feel like those monsters have already quite a few weaknesses, so I might not give them a 9 wisdom, but I'll think about it. Charis and wisdom is a very important saving throw. Of course, I can give them 9 wisdom, and then a profici proficiency in a wisdom saving throw, but... I don't like doing that. I feel like if some monster is bad with wisdom or intelligence or dexterity, then its saving throw should not redeem them, despite the Dungeon Master's Guide telling you otherwise. 
I like things to be thematic, I like things to make sense. If those monsters are stupid, for instance, I don't want them to be good with intelligent saving throws. So, I'll think about the wisdom. Charisma, let's think about this. I do like the idea of those monsters being charismatic. They are the Songborn. Song is the me, is how they communicate. They come from the Feywild. Feywild creatures are very enchanting. Even the evil ones tend to have decent charisma scores. And those guys are no exception. I think I'll give them a good old 15 right there. So they will have a plus two bonus to any sort of uh, abilities later down the line. Some of the Songborn might have an even higher charisma bonus. But this already implies that they're not that bad at any charismatic checks, be that scary ones, for instance, intimidation or performance or whatever. Moreover, I think it just fits for the song bond. So I can now deal with the skills. So looking at the skills, do they want those monsters to be acrobatic? Not particularly. They are already nimble. I don't need them to be acrobatic. Animal handling. Now you see, this is when I can rethink the wisdom thing. Because I want those monsters to tame monsters such as rust monsters. And taming a rust monster, it requires a fair bit of skill. So maybe the idea of giving those guys low wisdom, not the best idea in the world. I would instead give them a wisdom of 12, which already makes animal handling better. And I will also make them proficient in animal handling. They're really good with animals. They have a natural bond with the creatures of the wild, which... I mean, I think it fits. It really fits for a fake creature. So let's go ahead and give them a proficiency with animal handling. Since those guys will be quite good with animals. They have the flying steeds as well, after all. Alright, Arcana. Basic Sunbone Grants shouldn't really have that. That being said, those are the creatures, those are the fey. They came from the fey world, even though they're no longer parts of the fey world. I kind of want them to have a basic understanding of planes or rather beyond basic understanding of planes. Just to know what's going on and whatnot. I think Arcana, fun thing for them to have. Athletics, certainly not. They have nothing to do with that. Deception, nah. If they want to, do, to be deceptive, they already have decent charisma score. But for the most part, if they want to deceive someone, they just threaten them, I feel like, maybe. Or they just, they don't really like talking to intelligent races. So I don't care about that. History, no. Insight, I said that I don't want the gut feeling to be too good, so inside is going to stay where it is. Intimidation? No, because I don't feel like they want to interact with uh, other races too much unless they're animals, so they wouldn't practice the intimidation. Maybe against each other, but again, I feel like the raw plus two is good enough. Investigation? No, they don't care enough. Medicine? Probably not, actually. They're too magical to worry about regular old medicine. Nature checks. I said those guys are supposed to be good with animals. That doesn't imply that they're good with nature as a whole. So I'm going to leave it as it is. Perception is the most important skill in the entire game. So it's something that most players and most DMs always have on their monsters and characters because holy piece of cake, that's so... <laughs> I actually said it. Wait, wait, I have to do this. I said holy piece of cake. There, in the chat, there's an... There's going to be another holy piece of cake, because I have those now. Yay! Self-promotion. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so anyway, I was talking about perception. So it's super important, but I don't feel like I really need it, especially if I keep the electrolocation. Electrolocation will make sure that if anybody comes close to the Songborn, and uh, because electrolocation will give the Songborn blind sight, I don't know if it will only work in the water or if it will work outside the water as well, I need to think about that. But if they have a bit of blind sight, that's good enough. That's more than good enough, in fact, that's amazing. Especially since it's not equal location, so that's already better than just regular equal location blind sight. So given the perception, not necessary. And I don't want it to be that perceptive either. Performance, not necessary. I don't know who they would perform for, although they like probably like singing. So they need to have performance because, again, they sing a lot. And again, this is a trap, so they should have some skills inherently available to them. And I'm giving them quite a lot. Usually, if you transmit and whatnot, one or two skills is more than enough. Unless you're talking about major NPC. But those guys are awesome. They are magical. They're from the Feywild. They have a lot of skills. Next up, persuasion. Again, they don't need to persuade anyone. Religion. I don't think they care that much about religion. Side of hand. 
they don't know why they would need that. I don't know why they would need that at least. So let's leave that. Stealth. Stealth is interesting. They come from the Feywild. In Feywild, there are more dangerous things than them. But I don't think they're really necessary cardboards hiding, especially if they like singing. So no. Finding survival. Tempting. Not necessary. Not necessary. Let's just leave it. Finally, again, I talked about damage vulnerabilities and condition immunities and all of the like. I don't think they necessarily need any immunities or whatnot, even now. Now, as for languages, if I have a brief view at, again, the sprites or the fawns, etc., we know that Sylvan is something that all of those uh, monsters, the Fey, often use. Sylvan is a Fey language, after all. So with that in mind, I definitely want those guys to speak Sylvan. They are from the fair one after all, after all. But I also want them to be able to communicate with the players somehow. So my idea is, I do I give them just the good old common? I feel like it makes some degree of sense to give them common for the very simple reason that there are a lot of songs in common, but they might despise common actually. You know what I will do? In this case, when you're the dungeon master and you don't want your monster to just be common, you can do a cheaty little thing and look at your player characters and see what language, what unorthodox language they speak. So let, I'll just open all my ca player character sheets. Give me a second as they open. Road 20 isn't always the fastest, but I love it nevertheless. So Vuna, our wizard with 12 armor class. That's awful. <laughs> Sorry, Vuna. I love Vuna. She's my favorite character, by the way, out of those three. But her armor class is abysmally bad. Which I like. Like She actually has a flaw, which is funny and interesting. Anyway, languages. Common Goblin Dwarvish Undercommon. Undercommon is tempting, because I do want my Songbond to be creatures that prefer the Underground. So Undercommon is already an option, and my players will be able to talk with them if I give them Undercommon. Good. Goblin Dwarvish is certainly not a thing. Next up, Lear. He's got Common Undercommon Draconic Elvish. Elvish seems like a simple option for a fake creature, but I don't think that the Songbone really liked elves all that much, especially since the Songbone kept to the underground when they were still in the Feywild, so I don't think any of those options fit me. Finally, let's look at what the Honey can speak, and Honey can speak Common Dwarvish, and that's it. Alright, I'll just stick to the Undercommon then. I might slap one more thing in there as well, however. So... Let's think about it real quick. I this Undercommon is certainly a thing. Now, they have a base intelligence of 10, which tells me that those monsters are necessarily the best, uh, mo the best guys that know a lot of languages and whatnot. I feel like they wouldn't know all that many. Two is already quite a lot for a 10 intelligence uh, creature, in my opinion. So I'll just leave them with seven and other common. I could have given them something else that they could have picked up, but maybe the ha the other Songbone creatures uh, that serve more important roles in the society will know more languages. This is just an average Joe. Average Joe would probably know Sylvan, would probably know a bit of Undercommon, at least the swear words maybe, some songs from Undercommon actually, that makes more sense. So yeah, I like that. Are we about ready? We are about ready. I already filled in the speed, the walking speed, speed and the swimming speed. And I like uh, where they are. I don't want those monsters to be too fast. I do think I want to give the moss those monsters saving throw proficiency in something. The question is what it should be. So I'm going to briefly, again, use row 20. And I'm going to go into Compendium. I should probably show you that, shouldn't I? So give me a second. I'll go into Compendium and I'll look for saving, uh, saving throws. And this will not death saving throws. Is this not going to tell me that? Is that only in the, the in the PDF? That's a bummer if it is. Well, I think a charisma saving throw is somewhat tempting. Now, charisma is not very useful, mind you. And that's why I'm a little bit hesitant. Now, with the recent additions to the game, charisma is more useful. But I don't believe my players actually have any charisma saving throws. They might get them in the future, of course, but I shouldn't necessarily rely on them. And giving those guys Charisma saving throw makes some degree of sense, because Charisma is about resisting being exiled to another plane. But in my lore, they have been exiled to Material Plane from the Feywild. 
So they shouldn't be all the professions with charisma saving throws. Intelligence is tempting because they don't want to be taken over by, uh, you know, to be influenced and one not mind controlled. But just because they would don't want to be mind controlled doesn't mean they're good at resisting that. In fact, I think they might be a little bit gullible. So you know what? We'll come back to the good old wisdom saving throw, which is the most important one anyway. And I'll just give them proficiency in that. They are creatures from the fairy, from the fairy world. I feel like they should be at least somewhat attuned to magic because they are not just your good old fake creatures. They are relatively strong. And one saving throw doesn't make enough of a change to really impact this uh, monster's challenge rating. But it is a nice touch. And because my party is very, very he heavily reliant on wisdom, uh, on imposing wisdom saving throws, and especially the paladin, that's the good point. The, I designed those creatures to not to be stronger against the paladin than other members of my of my player's party. So for that reason, uh, proficiency, proficiency in wisdom saving throw is a very good idea because guess what? Paladins use wisdom saving throws, wisdom saving throws quite a lot. And I'm done. Of course, I still need to fill in uh, all the text, make it more, uh, make it actually fit to what we are present with in the game itself. But other than that, I have everything I need to have. I don't think I'll give those guys Dark Vision. I gave all, almost all of my monsters Dark Vision, and it's boring. So many monsters have Dark Vision. Those ones will not have Dark Vision for a change. They actually have to see things or stand within 15 feet of it so that they can sense it with ele electrolocation. Which I might actually make it work so that it works both in water and out of water, maybe. So yeah, that monster is done, and uh, wow, it's been two hours. Of course, I wasn't streaming for the entirety of the two hours. The first 15 minutes was just me announcing the stream, and afterwards I was uh, waiting for a few people to show up. So it's more like an hour and 40 minutes. So I will definitely not have enough time to design and time up. This would be way more than what I'm capable of. But I could show you how I start designing a map. I was planning to design one more monsters, you know, the winglets that I showed you at the start of the stream that the songbone would write uh, around on and, you know, use to move from place to place. But for the time being, let's just show you how I start working on a map. Just to start, I don't have that much time, but 15 minutes will do just to show you the, how the process goes generally. So if I go into Dungeon Painter Studio, and uh, actually, give me a second, I might reveal some sensitive information, so I'll not show you that for a second, I'll show you that in a moment, just give me a sec, be patient please, I'll show you another map that I created in the past, as, uh, just to give you an example of what you can do over here. And it's taking a while to load because it's a big map, again, sorry, I'll show you that in a second, the Independent Studio is right now creating layers, it takes some time sometimes uh, because Dungeon Painter Studio, well, I do love how versatile this software is. It's sometimes a little bit buggy and sometimes a little bit inefficient. But that doesn't matter if it's good, right? And if it serves its purpose. And in my opinion, it does. So I can now change the screens and la di da, I present to you Dungeon Painter Studio. It's uh, and a map I created within Dungeon Painter Studio. It was a very big map and a very long adventure, as you might imagine. It had several different layers. Of course, this doesn't show any of the tokens or my personal notes or whatever. This is just a map that I then import into Roll20 and then I put tokens directly on top of this map as well as everything else. This is just the background. Again, like I explained at the start of the stream, I'm not a native English speaker. But I do run my sessions for native English speakers, so I need my maps to be as precise and as full of details as possible to make it easier for me to explain things, because sometimes my vocabulary just runs short. So in here, the player character started on the top here, and then I climbed all the way through the bottom to here where there was an exit from this particular system. I would call it a cave system, and it actually is a cave system, but it's, as you can see, constructed by something and whatnot. And this is what Dungeon Painter Studio can really allow you to do, create very intricate and very detailed dungeons. 
So for instance, over here, I had arrays called the Midai, that uh, arrays that, uh, of wizards that really like transmutation magic and whatnot. I won't give you too many details. But up above, because this tower, tower and the cave system was designed by race that is, has long been extinct, is it has just recently been taken over by the Midai. So they started redecorating, as you can see on this level, they started redesigning things and make it more suit their style. Whereas up above, another race lived of the most people, which are just the plant people that don't care that much, they're relatively sterile, they just want to grab magical items. Cool race, by the way, I really like them. I might talk about them in a stream at some point in the future if people want to see more Dungeons and Dragons streams, of course. But anyway, that's what this uh, thing allows you to do. I don't have a lot of time, but I'll just briefly show you how I start creating what you see right now. So let's go ahead and create a new map. Let's zoom out a little bit and think. So I want an island for my players. All right, I don't need to worry about water that can be created later, of course, by just grabbing water over here and painting something like that. But this is one of the latest steps, actually. We can do that afterwards. For the time being, what I care about is thinking about the size and of the thing I want to design and the purpose. So what I want to design is a small island somewhere off the, uh, off the charts where the smugglers come to make a stop. Because like I said, the campaign takes place on an archipelago with five major islands, but there are small islands in between those five major islands. And this will be one of the five of those many smaller islands where smugglers can go to just rest away from the prying eyes, stash their loot and whatnot, and one and so forth. Moreover, this island, because of uh, this island's strategic location, in the past somebody made a stronghold on it or a tower or something. So later on, the Sungborn that we already designed decided to adapt to, to adapt the power, not power, tower, sorry, I failed at English right there, adapt the tower to their own needs. And uh, I'll have the Songborn inside the tower, so the tower will have to be filled with whatever the Songborn would want, but it would have also some corridors and rooms that the Songborn wouldn't want because they're not the ones that made the tower. Moreover, I don't want this uh, adventure, this short trip to this island, to be just about fighting the Songbone. Because, I mean, of course, maybe the players will be able to talk to the Songbone. They won't be immediately f deadly and super wanting to kill the players. They will be hostile, but not... We're gonna kill you hostile. So anyway, I do want the players to have a chance to interact with some less hostile NPCs. So maybe there will be a beach where some human smugglers go. And maybe the smugglers have a deal with the Songborn so that the Songborn leave the human smugglers alone and the human smugglers leave the Songborn alone. So, and together they provide a bit of protection for each other since the neither of the groups wants to have any intruders come into their island. So, okay, I know I want a beach, I know I want a tower. So, for towers and the like, I usually create uh, several floors, right? I mean, it's a tower, it's supposed to have several floors. I usually design all floors on the same plane so that I don't have to swap scenes when I'm on row 20, so that my players can just look at the map and I can keep revealing the map as we go along. So what I would design is most likely like some kind of area where the island itself is and where one level of uh, the tower is, most likely the upper level, the roof, if I want there to be a roof that you can walk on. And then next to it, there will be the tower itself. So let's start doing that, shall we? For the time being, I'm not going to be too careful. I'm going to just go ahead and use a puddle. Puddles are something that I really, really like. Let's go for a blurry puddle. That's fairly smooth. And go ahead and look for some sand. Because again, it's an island in the middle of the sea. It's going to be mostly sandy, although because it has a tower, it will need to have some terrain, ground, something to build upon. So it will have something else as well. But for the most part, sand, beach, paradise. Tropical, tropical paradise. So this looks like a good enough sand. So if I want my island to be somewhere, let's think, I want a beach to be, um, to, to 
I want the pitch to be fairly peaceful, so a nice bit that small boats can row over to. So the pitch will be right over here. And then the rest of the island will go somewhere like this. Kind of a rectangular shape. I don't have to worry about how it looks exactly right now. I can be fairly detailed as you can see, or I don't have to be. This is just the base, this is the island right now, as we have it. So, okay, keep in mind that each square is corresponds to one square on row 20. So this is already a very, very big map, but again, it's an entire island, and the players will most likely be zoomed for the most part to something like this. So just to make it easier to see how big the map actually is, let's draw some ground as well. Maybe some grass? Grass, it's the tropics after all. I'm sure some grass would grow somewhere. Uh, you know, palm trees and whatnot, but for the time being, let's go ahead and look for vegetation. But anyway, recommend Matt Flo's package. It's on the Steam Workshop, like I said, great stuff. And vegetation A17 is something I frequently use for this purpose, so I can say that maybe there's a bit of grass right over here. Again, it doesn't look pretty. I'll, I'll work on making it pretty after I know how it's supposed to look exactly. And then maybe I will have a bit more grass over here. Like that. So maybe there will be a little bit of a cliffside and the tower will be somewhere here. So this isn't a very large basis for a tower, but it's not supposed to be a castle. It's supposed to be just that, a tower that somebody made in the middle of the sea again. So maybe those will be hills, I'll work on making them look like hills later on. But the tower itself uh, apparently looked like a dog's grass, <laughs> Mukimugu said in the chat. Um, I don't know, maybe. Either way, I want the tower to be somewhere, so I don't know if I'll represent the tower on this level or not. I'll just represent the roof most likely. So for the time being, I could just paint it or I could go for an object and put it. And before I do that, I'll group my layers so that this will be the ground layer. And then I will have a structure layer, an object layer. For that, I recommend using, if you look at the workshop for Dungeon Painting Studio, there's one called Tops Collection. By the way, those files, for the most part, they're not for commercial use. For commercial use, you have the commercial use pack, but it's fairly barren, so I don't recommend that necessarily. I mean, if you want to make some commercial, just hire an artist. I do this for my players, and I do this for fun. They don't pay me for this. So anyway, for from Tops Collection, I'll go ahead and look for buildings. And I have a few options here. I don't think any of those really look like a tower, with a few exceptions. Oh, that's snow. I don't want snow. Those are just houses. They don't really look like what I'm going for. This is the best thing I've got. I don't like this. And this thing, again, not quite the tower I was looking for. So instead of plotting down a structure, I'll change my pl original plan. And instead, I'll go ahead and create a roof. So let's go back to not mud walls. Those are walls, as you might imagine. Let's go back to my walls. Let's look for checkered. Hmm. Would pirates make checkered floor? I mean, it's not the pirates who made the star in the first place. Place. Uh, maybe those were elves. Maybe it was somebody else. I don't think checkered really fits. Maybe I'll go for something else. Maybe tiles. Tile stone. Let's see what we have. Those are too pretty to cover the roof of a tower. Let's see uh, something else. Tiles painted. Again, not ideal. Tiles broken. That's. A little bit more like it. That's something I could believe that could go at the top of a tower. This tower broken. Let's see if this tower is just like this 10 by 10. 10 by 10 is a little bit small for a tower. It would be a little bit tight and I don't want this tower to be all that small. 15 by 15 still going to be fairly tight but this will allow the Sunborn to use their ranged weapons to a certain degree before they have to engage in melee. And maybe the tower also has like a little bit of uh, bits sticking out of it, like over here, where most stuff will be, or maybe this is where the staircase will be, or something else. I don't want this to just be a regular, uh, you know, rectangular shape that would be a little bit boring. Maybe it also has a, maybe actually, the, hold on, let's undo that. Maybe it will have the staircase over here, and another stick is over here just to move up and down and this will be just a place where more rooms are just to give more, re play, more 
place that the inhabitants of the star can live in and just so this that this doesn't look as boring as it otherwise would in fact it probably needs to be a little bit bigger to make sense so like that and like that and now there's enough room for a staircase here so that's the basis of the, that's how the tower is going to look like again i'm going to I could have moved this into this group, so I'm going to ungroup because I can still do that in a group and that's going to be the basis of everything. And now I'm going to add some walls. Now walls are very nice because by being separated from everything else you can easily add shadows to them and make things look three-dimensional. So if I go for mud walls, again mud has a lot of awesome packages. And I go for main, which uses a lot of the some of the assets that are actually come by default from Dungeon Painter Studio. So let's see, let's look for a fitting wall. Like, it's a fairly bright stone, right? So maybe this will work. Let's zoom in a little bit closer so I can see the effects. And maybe make it a little bit thicker. It's the outside wall after all, maybe like 120 will do, I think. And then I'll make this a polyline so I can modify how it looks like. So, I'll just make it all the way, the entire tower, just make it like this. And right now it doesn't really stand out, right? Like it looks almost like the exact same like the texture of this tower itself. Fear not, however, I can change it quite easily. So I'll group this already because I will have a group for walls in the future. And for walls you want to apply a long shadow effect. You can modify the effects and it's a really awesome tool this is what allows me to for instance make things look like they're three dimensional i can make cliffs with uh, by creating uh, artificial artificial shadow for instance if i wanted to make something that looks like a cliff i could create a new preset preset let's not apply this preset but let's just edit it and make some drop shadow add and then you make drop inner which would make it look like it's actually Drop like this is not sticking outwards, but it's sticking, but it's actually a dent in the map per se. I mean, just look at this, and uh, it's not visible enough. But if you see, of course, it's a little bit tricky for making things look like cliffs. I usually use two sets of uh, drop shadows one for dropping shadow on one side, and one for dropping shadow from the other side to make it more, look more natural. But right now, I'm not doing that, I'm just applying the long shadow thing and this looks okay ish but i kind of want this to look a little bit better but again this stream is already too long so i won't bother with making this look better i'm just showcasing a feature so this is a tower that i'll have over here and everything that is not the tower or the island is going to be that's going to this group is going to be water and i might as well add the water in already so i'll go back to mud floors now go for water and again i won't really think too much or too hard about how the water is supposed to look i'll zoom out even further actually and i didn't leave enough place for me on this map so if the players want to swim to the north of the island that's going to be annoying hopefully they won't famous dm's last words players always want to do what you least expect them to so let's just make this all water like this and stick out a little bit of course i don't have to include this all Move this down, and this is the map. This is way too bright. I know this is just for demonstration purposes, but let's edit this and change the water. This is a bit better. For now, it's good enough. I'm just demonstrating a feature. So, when designing a map, I have to take into consideration the fact that bandwidth is a thing, not all players have fast internet connection, and also I don't want this map to be very expansive. So, if this and this are sort of the top and bottom lines of this map, and that's where the map will be, then I want to make the rest as compact as possible and not go below those imaginary lines just to save space on row 20. Because row 20 doesn't like when maps are too big. So, what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to select this tile. In fact, I'll select all of these tiles, copy them, and I'll paste them. And I'll move them somewhere else. So this is going to be how our tower looks from the inside. This will be the level one of the tower. And I can just have it in here like this. And then I'll let the player see this, but not the black void around this. And this should look fine. The players never complained about this. And how many levels do I want this tower to have? 
let's say I want this to have at the very least two levels but it's a tower in the middle of the sea the pirates probably used it as a lookout place to see incoming ships and whatnot so three levels I believe is the very minimum and you know what why not have it have a cellar as well and for the cellar I probably don't need it to look exactly like the entire tower looks since it's the cellar it can look a little bit different so let's say if this is the cellar I can for instance uh, take those bits away actually no those are supposed to be the staircases so let's keep them in let's take that away and paint some more tiles something that will connect the two so I'll go back to what did I use again I believe I used the tiles broken right yes I did so let's do something to connect them for the time being very rough idea maybe just a tunnel like this that it goes in between and then a few rooms that lead into cells or hoarding places you know a treasury or something we don't need this to be a fully fleshed out area so maybe a small little room over here like a granary maybe I'm sure they would have a granary or something again I don't want this entire place to be occupied as well because maybe some of this is just you know pavement and what not pavement uh, no the basis for this construction I forgot the word from foundation that's the word I was looking for so maybe maybe they would actually have an escape route so something that leads over to the beach over there so maybe they'll have an escape route that leads a little bit further down and uh, then a panic room over here ish something like that yeah that seems like a good panic room to me so this, there's an escape route and a panic room and because obviously whoever designed this uh, this uh, construction was smart they don't want the panic uh, room to be obvious so what they're going to do is make this corridor a little bit longer this would be a secret door and then there will be some kind of room over here at the end to pretend like this uh, corridor had uh, a reason to exist in the first place right so something like this and I don't like how this room is again a square so maybe let's make it a little bit more interesting and make it into something like that this looks kind of odd but maybe there's a reason for this room to look the way it does I don't have to think about this I just want this to look a little bit more interesting this is good enough and I'll have a secret passage here everything else will be good next step would be adding walls and I should be ending the stream already my throat is starting to give out after talking for so long but I'll take a sip of my tea and start working on the runes themselves just to show you how I start working maps and maybe maybe I'll stream map making in the future again hmm. so for now I'll just worry about the uh, first level so if this is the underground and maybe it would make sense to go from the highest level lower level bottom level and the underground so this will be where the players come in and as they ascend they will go higher I, it just makes sense to me so this will be the first starting room so let's move out of this folder go back into the walls folder and go back into our wall so let's change it to mad walls let's change the thickness this will be a lower thickness we're inside now we don't need to showcase how thick our walls are in fact this might be that might be how I make this wall look better but that's for later so there will be a door in the middle so let's see this is one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven tiles long so this should be fine unless I did my maths wrong which is very possible never try to do maths when you're live streaming or anything at all live streaming just makes everything more difficult than it usually is unless you're a seasoned live streamer or just made for this job so this will be the entrance and seemingly the only entrance of course there will be a hidden passage but the players are not supposed to know about it unless they watch this live stream but i explicitly told them not to if they do it's their fault for taking the fun out of this and maybe who knows maybe i'll move this uh, hidden passage after the stream is over so mm, maybe i'll be tricksy like that anywho so there will be a door in the middle and the players will walk through so all right i now have to think about two things making the layout of this uh, tower fun for the players 
So, interesting, not just a corridor with a bunch of rooms adjacent to it that the players can check out one by one, which is boring. Think more, more along the lines of Imagine of something like we would see in a board game, like Murder on the House on a Hill, or how this board game was called, which is an awesome board game, by the way. So I want this to be a little bit tricksy and interesting thing to fight in. I want the battle arenas, places where most likely combat is going to happen, to look cool. But most importantly, well not most importantly, but the second most importantly, I want this to make sense. So I need to figure out what the original constructors, constructors of this tower wanted and how would they achieve what they wanted. So, I know that at some point in the past this tower was uh, taken over, or at least owned by somebody who could summon things from the other planes of existence. Lower planes of existence to be more exact. So demons and the like, devils most likely. Fun stuff. So, I could just say that the wizard made it. Or the wizard formed the tower and adapted it to his needs. And now, years afterwards, the song bomb that we designed earlier took over the tower since the wizard is long gone. Alright, so this tower would most likely have some kind of security mechanism, either outside, so I can either add an encounter, a possible encounter here, which I like the idea of. So, immediately, I know I want to create a little bit of something here. So mud walls, for the time being, everything is going to be done in the same texture. So if this is uh, the entrance, maybe it's like this, and maybe over here there will be some kind of devious mechanism to open the door from outside if you don't have the key. Maybe there isn't even a key. Maybe you cannot open it without activating some sort of mechanism. And there will be a lot of defenders as well. So, you know, just to protect this with its privacy and whatnot. So over here, that's three, and then that's seven. Seven by seven, so this kind of round area. And then there may be, uh, there, maybe I will have a staircase that will go, it's a lot for half. Maybe we'll have a staircase going from, let's say over here down to the beach. So like so. Right now, of course, again, I'm not uh, worrying about how to make it look pretty. I'll do that after the stream is over. I'm just showing you the original, just the basic idea of how I design maps. Okay, so this will be the welcome area. Over here will be wonderful, wonderful traps. Or rather, some kind of devious mechanism that will that the players will have to deal with before they can actually enter the tower in the first place. And this will be also a plot hook, because the players, once they see a devious mechanism, you know how the players are! They will want to investigate, because it's curious, it's fun, it's something that they can mess around with and get killed by. What's better than that? So let's go into objects, let's go ahead and go into, again, Top's collection, I love this. And uh, over here I will scroll down until I found objects, statues, etc. I think I'll have something in the middle that the players will be able to interact with and a bunch of uh, statues around it, or maybe not statues, maybe suits of armor. I think there was something like that. Objects, armor, yeah, that's that's nice. So I have just a bunch of things that will look very threatening to the players and make them unnerved and also want to investigate. And maybe they will, maybe they will, this will also give them an opportunity to act smart. Maybe they'll prepare for potential trouble and think about what they want to do. So I'll use all four of those models. And I'll use custom angles, so let's go for a 45 degree angle here and put this guy in this corner right here, so over here and over here and like that. I like to be symmetrical, but this would be an issue since the path to the beach is over here, so maybe I won't be that symmetrical. Maybe I'll just have three uh, suits of armor, so then I want to have another suit of armor, let's see. 315, I, oh, hold on a second, I need to change the sensitivity of my mouse. I know it's not that important, but it is to me. Okay, change the sensitivity even further. There we go. And now I want this guy to be placed in here, nice and easy. And finally, the last guy is going to be placed maybe in the bottom. So just a flat out 180 degree angle over here. So three suits of armor, who knows what they are? Maybe they're part of a, of a trap, maybe they're part of the mechanism to open the door. 
I don't know. Neither will the player. The players. Actually, this guy needs to stand. I don't think it's symmetrical, but you know what? I don't care that much. And since those are objects, I'll group them together, and they're relatively tall things, so I'll give them a middle shadow. And I want something in the middle for the players to interact with, so I'll go back to object statues, make sure I can place down objects. And this will be another threatening statue, so maybe a statue of a demon that's too threatening, also too big. Of course, I can scale things down, but that's not what I want. So maybe just another statue like this. No, I want something that's spherical, maybe. This statue, I have no idea what it is. Maybe a toad statue, because the wizard was a jokester. No, I don't feel like this. I'm not feeling it. The demon statue, that is more tempting. This would also scare off any random invaders. And I'm sure that this wizard, who wanted to conjure up some devils, didn't want any invaders. So maybe that or uh, this kind of statue. This one is more formidable and a little bit more devious, but this is more of a budget statue. And how much can you really spend on the statues, really? Let's not dilly dally for too long. Let's go for this statue. Let's make it a little bit smaller. I really like the statue, so that's why I went with this. And let's change the angle so that it faces the players when they ascend up the path. So it's in the middle over here. And I probably wanted to stand on some sort of pedestal, so I'm going to give it that. And I can make it look like a pedestal by just going for, again, some kind of terrain. I can go for, let's say, maybe not carpet. Carpet would be bad. <laughs> this would be quite unusual, although suddenly eye-catching. I can tell you that for a fact. But no, let's go for mud floors and let's go for something that maybe didn't break or maybe something industrial. No, I don't like industrial, that's more for science fiction settings. Maybe something like... Damage trance? No, debris, fire, lava, grates. Let's think how I want this uh, to look. I think there was something... Not industrial, but there's something metallic, or how is it called? Metal? Metal, that's how it was called. So maybe I'll go for some metal and make it look like... That's unusual. This looks unusual. So I'll make a circle around here that the statue is standing on top of, so the circle will be like this. And I can make the shadow seem even bigger than it looks right now by applying an effect on top of an effect that already works. Because this effect on a group applies to the entire group, but if I apply another effect to something, it will increase the effect, as you can see already. So maybe a long shadow. That's actually a little bit too tall, it looks too tall, but this clearly stands out in my opinion. Maybe I can make it bevel a little bit. That looks actually kind of nice, I like it. Yeah, I'll make I'll the bevel effect. And yeah, now this is again not very pretty, I would need to make it a little bit prettier later down the line. But for now, it suits my needs, it, I, and for the future purposes I know that this is going to be a trap slash puzzle room where the players you know have that the players have to go through in order to open the doors and if they don't manage to do this properly something bad will happen and if they uh, so there will be that okay oh and i forgot i did want to have another place a shack on the beach or so close to the beach for the player smugglers but that can be added later post stream since i've been streaming for a while but this shows you the example of how you'd create rooms this room was created because it makes sense and it, from gameplay perspective and storytelling perspective. The gameplay wise, it gives the player something fun to do, interesting, unusual, potential source of experience, as well as being a very good plot hook to encourage the players to go inside the tower. It's scary, players like scary, and uh, it's interesting and unusual, players again love that. So I don't need to do anything else. Just by seeing this, the players will want to go inside. I can bet that they will do just that. Moreover, this place makes sense since uh, since some kind of evil wizard created this uh, this kind of entry mechanism. Probably a mad genius or somebody who likes to believe to be a mad genius. So instead of just investing in a lock, he wanted something fancy, something showy, something that would keep off any intruders. That's why the complex mechanism as opposed to a keyhole. I'm sure the wizard himself just knew a passcode that would open the doors without having to solve a clue, but maybe if the door stuck, there was some kind of mechanism to open the door as well. 
if, I don't know, the wizard ran out of magic or the doors ran out of magic or whatever. It makes sense and it's good. And that's going to be it. I think uh, this stream calls for an end by now because it's been a very long one and uh, my throat is killing me. So I need to end this right now. But it was fun. I like doing this. I hope that people will like it when I post it on YouTube. And I hope that you who joined me live also enjoyed this. Here I'll give you as a goodbye a holy piece of cake. This is an emoticon for people who subscribe to me because yeah, it's somebody subscribed to me a few days ago, my very first subscriber. So I made this, this subscriber has something to use. It's a holy piece of cake because I say, say that sometimes. Again, thank you very much for watching and I will see you online. All right, as promised, this is me again, and I'm here with an afterword. So, as you can see, this is our Songbond skirmisher that I was designing during over the course of this live stream. And after a day passed, I decided uh, to actually polish him up, and uh, I came up with the final result, the thing that I actually I would consider worthy of actually being using in my campaign, something that is actually ready. So let's talk about the things that I had to change or cut. First of all, it's something on the ability, which you can see I decided to keep the wording of it, which was There's advantage on attack rolls against the Sagabon Grant when it uh, took no damage during the last turn of combat. That was actually so my attempt at changing the way this thing works. Because initially it was just, hey, disadvantage when the Sagabon Grant has full health. I decided to make it a little bit more powerful. And I was trying to fiddle around with the other active ability, which allowed the Songbon Grant to help to grant the enemy's disadvantage on attacks if the Songbon, until the Songbon Grant takes any damage. So initially, I thought that the Songbon Grant just has too many active abilities, and also I didn't I didn't really like how the Venom Strike allowed the Songbon Grant to retreat. I mean, I do like that part, but what I didn't like is then spending an entire action to use an ability that the Songbon Grant might as well use in the middle of the combat. What's the point in using the Venomous Strike? So I decided to take away this ability, as the, that was the first change that I did, and then I tried to do something else and just decided to make it l check if Songbon Grant took any damage in the last turn of the combat. By the way, I did change the Grant's name to a Skirmisher, because that's what it is, Songbon Skirmisher. Anywho, and I kind of like this idea at first, but then I thought to myself, well, first of all, there's an issue of there being no mechanisms that I'm aware of in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition that actually check a condition which happened during the last turn of combat, for instance. It's more like some all conditions I can think of only apply as something that changes the future rather than checks what happened in the past. And I can see why. It's something, it forces DMs and players to remember things that they really don't have the time or the mind power to remember. So I decided to just change this ability completely. And I did want it to still work like, like to just have the same. So I decided to change this ability completely and work a little bit like, I don't know, something that you might remember from a different creature called Displacer Beast. Now a Displacer Beast is a very well-known creature which also comes from the Fairy Wilds and it has a displacement ability which allows, uh, which makes attack rolls against it have a disadvantage until the Displacer Beast is hit by an attack. Sound familiar? It's basically the same thing I was going for with uh, the Songbone Skirmishers and Songbone in general. So I, for a second I thought about just giving the Songbone the displacement ability, but I didn't really like the lore and I felt like it doesn't quite fit them, so I just made a little twist on it, but it's still for the most part displacement ability. So let's have a quick look see at what it is right now. It's called Resonance. Attacks aimed at the Songbong Grant, that's Skirmisher now, must pass through a protective field of resonance, causing attack rolls against the Songbong Skirmisher to have a disadvantage. If it is still damaged, the trade is disrupted, blah blah blah. And it's also disrupted if the Songbong Grant is incapacitated or deafened. So it's a little slight change since uh, Displacer Beast's activity ability doesn't trigger if it has no movement speed. But Songbong Skirmisher is a little bit different. It needs to be able to hear 
the small protective field, or maybe to hear the surroundings. I'm not entirely sure how the magic lore works here. I can think about that later, but for the time being, it's basically the same thing, just with a slightly different mechanic, but it's basically a copy paste right here. And I really like it. It works, and it's something that I can easily make a ratio ability. So that's something that all of Songbon monsters will actually have, and I like it. Love it, actually. It fits real nicely. Now, the other thing, as you might already see, is that we're missing the Fey Ancestry thingy, which I used uh, to have going for the Songbon Grant or Skirmisher. The reason for that is that I had too many racial abilities, and this made my monsters a little bit too complex to run, especially if I were to share those monsters with the other DMs and whatnot, that could cause some issues, because every extra ability is another thing for the Dungeon Master to remember, and if there are too many things, the Dungeon Master might just forget some critical important ability that their monster has, and that's never a good thing. Now this is especially bad since, as you can see when you look at the right side of the screen, I am planning to have a lot of Songbon NPCs, and all of them will have the same racial abilities, that being Electro Location, Resonance, and the Venom Strike. Adding Fey Ancestry to this was just a little bit too much, and getting rid of it makes sense. There are very few, if any, actually, Fey creatures that have Fey Ancestry, and guess why? Because Fey Ancestry implies Fey Ancestry not being an actual Fey. Which is a bit strange because most Fey don't have the things that Fey Ancestry grants, but that doesn't matter. I just decided to cut it. Now the monster, this entire race is a little bit easier to wrap your head about. Now, I also made another change, and that being the change in adding this is a special ability that is exclusive to Songbone Skirmishers, although I might give it to Songbone Rogues as well, but I'll think about that. So this ability is called a Sling Expert, and it basically makes his slings very powerful and actually usable in a variety of different environments. It does increase the damage by a lot, and it doesn't really break the balancing that I worked so hard on over the course of this livestream. So a little bit of extra damage, but not enough to really increase this monster's challenge rating. It will make it more formidable, however. And it also encourages the monster to use better hand run tactics and attacking from a bigger range. Most importantly, improving the sling is something I was thinking about for a long time, for the very simple reason that slings in actual real life history, in, especially in the ancient times, were arguably way better than uh, bows. They had better range, for instance, which a lot of people don't realize. I also did it until recently. So, with the sling expert, this monster has no range that is better than short bow. Long bows obviously still have better range and whatnot, but this kind of sling is now actually quite effective, and I can easily see it being used when the Songbon raid some kind of ship, uh, some kind of a ship, since the Songbon are supposed to be pirates, sky pirates, but pirates nonetheless. They need an effective range weapon, and this one has very good range and decent damage as well for a weapon of this type. Especially since the Songbon can also use its shield while still firing at range, which is something that usually you're never able to do. So this makes uh, this sling a very viable option. Now, again, I was talking about how you want to have abilities that are as clean and simple to understand as possible, but in the case of Sling Expert, I don't believe that the complexity of this skill is really an issue. It does have three basic effects, but two of these effects are something that Dungeon Masters don't even have to worry about, since let's uh, dissect this real quick. If you look at, let me just make expand this ever so slightly. If you look at the three pounds that the Sling Expert grants, there's the extra range, which is just here, it's input, and the Dungeon Master will look at this and be like, okay, I can attack at full range, it's fine, and that's just a very easy change, so this text not really doesn't add too much to the complexity. The extra 1d4 damage, again, in row 20, that's just something that's automatically rolled whenever you click the Hunter Sling button. Not an issue either. And finally, we have the extra change that's allowing the monster to use a Sling and reload the Sling even when it's holding a shield. And again, it's just kind of a quality of life improvement for the Dungeon Master. Because now the Dungeon Master doesn't have to think, oh, do I hide the shield? Do I use the sling with two hands? Do I just fire from the sling once and then uh, change it for the coil sword? Now that kind of thinking is out of the question. So if anything, Sling Expert is 
to see it seems like it's complex but it's actually very simplistic and it lowers the workload for the dm in my opinion so i really like this ability and again it's not a ratio ability per se only the skirmisher and maybe the rogue will have it so i'm fine with uh, adding this ability in there Overall, this is uh, the final result. This is how the Songbon Skirmisher will look like in my future campaign. And that's about it. It was Pangolin Advisor. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you online.